You got that cough. You're fine. I just I got it too. Went down the wrong pipe. <laughs> <laughs> trying to do too many things at one time. Maybe we can't leave the highlight. I'm tripping. <laughs> On the other hand, yeah, this would be bad. Really you know, up at this practice or previous, <laughs> but uh, I'm wondering. I was just if you do it and it don't, we have to. Stop. Good evening. Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. It's good to have you here tonight. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the County Board of Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials have the final say on any of the issues that are before us this evening. If you wish to speak on an agenda item this evening, please go to the table to my left and you can sign up to speak. For those of you who wish to speak, please state your name and your address clearly at the podium when you come to speak. Each side speaking in favor and uh, speaking in opposition to an item, we each have 10 minutes to present for each side, and the time will be divided among the persons wishing to speak. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Thank you. May we have the roll call? Commissioner Alturk? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Present. Commissioner Ghosh? Here. Commissioner Bryan? Present. Commissioner Satterfield? Here. Commissioner Harris? Here. Commissioner Hyman? Present. Chair Busby? Present. Commissioner Miller? Here. Commissioner Kitchen? Here. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Present. Commissioner Van? Present. Commissioner Gibbs? Here. Commissioner Freeman? <laughs> Great, thank you very much. We will begin with approval of the minutes and the consistency statements from our November 14th meeting. Commissioner Bryan. I did notice uh, one minor thing. We have 13 commissioners listed as being present, but the motions on the first two items, adjustments and approval of the minutes were by 11 to zero votes. So. Somebody must have come in late. They did. Two and it, came it needs to be noted who they were. Yeah, we can do that. There were some late arrivals. We can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hyman. Yes. Um, first of all, let my, me offer my apologies to the staff for some of my scribbling, which wasn't clear. And this is on the, the 5520 Wake Forest Highway. I've offered some clarification in my uh, effort to list the four proffers. Um, I kind of mixed up the words, but I've listed them out. Uh, one was to create the 50-foot uh, building setback, the no more than 50 homes, a single bay car garage, and cap units at 79 were the notes that I made, and so they weren't quite clear, so I've offered them for clarification. Thank you so much. Um, we've received those, and we will correct your comments. Great, thank you. If there are no other comments, I will... Entertain a motion. Uh, I move approval of the minutes and consistency statements as amended. Second. Great. Properly moved and seconded. Uh, moved by Commissioner Bryan, seconded by Commissioner Al Turk. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Seeing none opposed, the motion passes. We will move to adjustments to the agenda. Um, I have two adjustments. I'm not sure if there's anything else from the staff's perspective. Staff does not have any adjustments. Great. I would like to propose that we would move the new business, the resolution honoring uh, Ms. Deidreanna Freeman to the very top. And then with that we also, we've had a request to move the public hearing on the compact neighborhood interim affordable housing bonus to be right after that. So moved, Mr. Chair. Second. Properly moved and seconded. Moved by uh, Commissioner Harris, seconded by Commissioner Bryan. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Any opposed? Great. We did have, for the record, we had one opposition. Great. Thank you. Staff didn't have any adjustments. We would like to affirm that all legal notices have been carried out in compliance with local and laws and UD, excuse me, the <clears throat> UDO, and those uh, affidavits are on file in our office. 
Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one other thing to note is for the commissioners, you have on in front of you the notice or the update on what to expect at next month's meeting, and Commissioner Harris noted that it said December 12th, and that that's actually meant to be next month, so it should be January 12th, 2018, and the staff will uh, email us an updated version tomorrow. Actually, January 9th. Oh, January 9th. We, today's December 12th, so it's January 9th, yeah. Thank you. All right. I was hoping we're having all year off. <laughs> <laughs> Have some good news and bad news. Uh, so next we will move on to our resolution honoring our former colleague, Deidre Anna Freeman. Deidre Anna, if you want to join me up front. I think as everyone here knows, Ms. Freeman served on the Planning Commission for a number of years, and last month was her final meeting as she's moved on to greener pastures and is now Councilwoman Freeman. But uh, it's always a pleasure to have you join us here. So I am honored to read this resolution in appreciation of Deidreanna Freeman and your service on the Planning Commission. Uh, whereas Mrs. Deidreanna Freeman was a member of the Durham Planning Commission from June 16th, 2014 through November 14th, 2017, and whereas the Durham Planning Commission and the citizens of the city and county of Durham have benefited from the dedicated efforts that she displayed while serving as a member of the Durham, Durham Planning Commission, and whereas this commission desires to express its appreciation for the job, the, the, of the job well done, now therefore be it resolved by the Durham Planning Commission that this commission does hereby express its sincere appreciation for the service rendered by Mrs. Freeman to the citizens of this community, and that the clerk for the commission is hereby directed to spread this resolution in its entirety upon the official minutes of this commission. And this resolution is hereby presented to Mrs. Freeman as a token of the high esteem held for her. Uh, adopted this 12th day of December, 2017. And I would invite you to share any comments if you would like. I just want to thank you all for uh support for the support that you've all provided in offering uh, your comments and also a lively debate on many of cases. I um, learned so much being here on the Planning Commission and I hope to continue to learn more as I continue as a council member on the City Council. I will be reading your comments, so please keep making them. Thank you. You're Mr. Chairman, to stay the four hours if you like, <laughs> <laughs> or longer. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Commissioner Miller, move the resolution. Second. Second. Great. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion is approved. Thank you. We'll move to what is now our first item on the agenda. This is the uh, public hearing TC16-005, Compact Neighborhood Interim Affordable Housing Bonuses. So we will begin with Ms. Jacobson and the staff report. Good evening. I haven't done this in a while. <laughs> I'm Pat Young, the director of the City County Planning Department. I've had the great fortune to work with many of you in my over seven years as primary staff support for the Planning Commission, and I frankly miss it. Uh, but I have not been here in, in several months since my appointment as director in April. Um, I did want to come uh, and introduce uh, this item uh, because um, it has some wide-ranging implications for a very important priority for the city and county, which is affordable housing. Um, with me today is Senior Planner Hannah Jacobson, as Chair Busby uh, introduced. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to her in just a few moments to talk about the um, proposed interim regulations. But first, I want to give a little bit of background uh, on how we got here. Uh, as many of you will remember, in 2015, uh, City Council and the Board of Commissioners adopted a goal of 15% of all 
uh, future housing units uh, to within a half mile of planned light rail transit stations should be affordable households with income of less than 60% of area median income. And that was subsequently adopted as policy in the comprehensive plan in 2016. Uh, and that gives us the ability within the confines of law to seek strategies that further that policy. Um, in furtherance of that policy, uh, the Community Development Department, um, under the leadership uh, uh, of then uh, a consultant to the city, Karen Lotto, who now is the Assistant Director of the Community Development Department and is with us here tonight, um, helped craft a affordable housing plan that was subsequently adopted. And one of the, the key strategies in that, which is displayed on your screen here, was to uh, consider uh, an enhanced density bonus to try to leverage uh, the zoning tool to have a market rate development generate affordable units, most likely within that 60 to 80% of AMI range. Um, and so what I wanna emphasize before I turn it over to Ms. Jacobson is, uh, and you've heard this from me and a number of our colleagues before, um, the zoning tool is only one tool uh, in the toolbox to help achieve the important affordable housing goal. Uh, and it's a tool that has got, uh, especially in North Carolina, the North Carolina law, a lot of limitations. Um, different strategies are required to ensure that aff affordability is maintained at different income levels. Um, this graphic is representative and, and conceptual, uh, but there is a fairly narrow range of incomes at which um, the uh, value of the additional zoning uh, entitlement uh, helps provide enough subsidy to provide the ho affordable housing. And I'll talk a little bit more about this following uh, Ms. Jacobson's presentation because I think this interim strategy you're gonna hear about tonight, um, a lot of components in this may be things that we carefully examine for a, a longer term strategy. I wanna talk a little bit about where we're at in, in terms of that evaluation. Um, this, what this uh, slide here depicts is what I said a moment ago. Um, there are a number of tools uh, there are different tools that are more effective at different income ranges, um, and there are different tools that are more effective for home ownership versus rental uh, options. We do think that um, the, the highest likelihood of success is in that 60 to 80 percent of area median income range, and Han will talk a little bit about what those income levels are, and uh, particularly for uh, rental products and because of some of the limitations of state law. And again, you'll hear more from Hannah and from me at the end. Um, and I do want to talk about exactly, like I said, before I turn it over to Hannah, where we've been. Um, like many North Carolina municipalities, including Durham and, and Charlotte, excuse me, Raleigh and Charlotte, we have had an affordable housing density bonus in our ordinance since the mid-1980s. Um, and from the mid-1980s until 2015, there was one required uh, aff committed affordable housing unit for one additional above baseline density uh, market rate unit. That provision was uh, not used and it was not used in, in uh, our peer cities either. Um, so with that concern of the ineffectiveness of incenting the affordable housing in 2015, uh, along with the other changes to make um, this bonus program more attractive, we increased with you all's review and support and with uh, City Council and Board of Commissioners adoption, the, that ratio of th to three to one, so that there would be three additional affordable housing units allowed uh, for every one market rate, uh, excuse me, three additional market rate units for every one affordable housing unit provided, excuse me. Um, what you're seeing tonight is a, is a much more robust attempt to try to find a, a level of uh, density that will adequately incent the market to respond to this incentive and to create affordable housing. As you're gonna hear from Hannah, it's, it's typically, depending on the baseline zoning in these different transit areas you know, in, the, in the order of five to seven to one in terms of the number of uh, market rate units that a developer can get by right um, it, with a provision of affordable housing unit. And we also have other changes that will, I, we think, help provide financial incentives to developers. But the key takeaway, before I turn it over to Hannah, that I wanna emphasize is we're working hard to find um, a tool that works. We don't want to just have a tool in the book for show. We've had that for 30 years. Um, and we, we are confident that this is an important step in that um, achieving that goal, but it is going to take uh, other tools, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll talk a little bit more about those following Hannah's presentation. Thank you all. 
Thank you, Pat. Thank you, members of the commission. Again, I am Hannah Jacobson, uh, Durham Planning Department. Um, and I'll be getting into some more of the nuts and bolts of the proposed text amendment that's in your packet. Um, before I do that, I do want to give a shout out to Commissioner Brian, who uh, notified staff uh, earlier this week of some inconsistencies between what's in this text amendment and what's in a later text amendment that you'll hear later in the evening, the omnibus. And um, we do uh, we do recognize and appreciate that comment and we'll work towards reconciling that and whatever version moves forward to the elected bodies. Um, so with that, uh, with that, I'll uh, get more into the details of the interim affordable housing bonus. Um, at the onset of the project, we laid out kind of three major objectives. Um, first is that we would, of course, like to encourage developers of multifamily housing to include affordable units into their projects. And when we do that, we would like them, we would like to see there be uh, establishment of good urban design principles kind of that are foundational to our compact neighborhoods and our design districts. And then finally, um, that this incentive be available by right or administratively um, that can help to reduce that acts as an incentive because it helps to reduce the time, the expense, and, and the uncertainty of moving forward with these types of projects. Um, to take a step back yet again, um, uh, what is an interim affordable housing bonus? Uh, it's a zoning tool that allows developers to build more, <coughs> more housing units, more height, more density, more floor area in exchange for um, a public good, in this case, affordable housing. And the theory behind that is that by building more market rate units, you can help, help to offset some of the costs that are accrued by providing the affordable units, um, lower rents, essentially. The reality, of course, is a lot more complicated to make the math work. It can be hard to balance some of the costs of land, construction, particularly with structured parking, and financing and still keeping those market rate units within, within reason. But that's the theory. Um, where can these proposed interim bonuses be used? Um, we have a two-step process. The first step or the first question to ask is, is the property within a compact neighborhood tier? Um, as many of you all know, compact neighborhood tiers are designations on our future land use map that are around our proposed regional rail transit lines. Um, there are six that are along the proposed Durham Orange Light Rail Line and two that are down near RTP um, that would be along the proposed Durham to Wake commuter rail line. Downtown is highlighted on this map for reference only, just to note that this would not apply to downtown because we do not regulate density in downtown. So that's the first step. Are you in a compact neighborhood tier? The second question or the second step to ask, uh, does the existing zoning district allow for multifamily housing? So this actually includes many of our commercial districts and the office institutional district, um, but it would exclude uh, single family housing zoning districts and in industrial zoning districts. So what's shown on the map here is an example at the Austin Avenue area where we've highlighted in green the places where the bonus would be eligible to be used because of what the base zoning is today. The basic structure of the bonus is pretty simple. Um, if a project is in one of those eligible locations and it meets the requirements for affordability and requirements for design, then you can get the density and the height bonuses. So what are those affordability requirements? Um, at least 15% of the total units must be affordable for a 30-year period. Um, and what we're proposing moving forward, we, uh, we're proposing a two-step process, and I should say that um, these, uh, the, this recommendation um, that we're moving forward with is the result of uh, meeting with some of the elected uh, at the work session of both the City Council and the Board of County Commissioners and getting their feedback on, on the way to move forward. Um, so where we are right now is that step one would be that a developer would propose a project to the city where 15% of the units are affordable to people earning 60% of area median income or less. 
the city would then, the city or the county would then get the opportunity to evaluate that project, determine whether or not it's uh, within their interest to participate financially in that project. Uh, step two would be if the elected board opts not to participate, then kind of the default requirement would become that 15% of the units are affordable to households earning 70, an average of 70% of area median income or less. And this would be done with a by right or administrative approval. So those are the affordability requirements. The, the design requirements, um, again, these help to build on some of what, you know, principles of good urban design that we would like to see moving forward in our compact neighborhood tiers. Um, that, you know, the building is placed on the site to help to create more of a human pedestrian oriented sense of, sense of uh, scale. That there'd be a visual interest that's created through um, windows and doors on the street fancy word for that in planning lingo is fenestration, um, that there's uh, pr the primary entrance, again, engages with the street, that pedestrian activity is encouraged through um, accessible sidewalks and enhanced through the use of streetscape amenities. So if you're in an eligible location, you meet the affordability requirements, your project meets the design uh, requirements, then you are entitled to the, the bonuses. And so what we're proposing is a maximum density of 75 units an acre, a maximum building height of 90 feet. Um, the exception to that is on the edges of the compact neighborhood tier in places where you're adjacent to uh, single family uses or single family zoning. In that case, the building height would be a maximum of 50 feet. Um, a, a significant bonus um, for these types of projects is that we would eliminate the minimum required parking. It's not to say that it, we don't think that projects would include parking within them. It's just eliminating the unified development ordinance as that barrier. And then finally, um, uh, seeking administrative approval, if, again, if the financial assistance is not, um, not utilized. And again, that, like I mentioned at the very beginning, that's regarded as an incentive because it eliminates the, the time and the cost and uncertainty of, of many rezoning requests. Uh, to look a little bit more closely at density, um, this graphic shows the, the, the range of densities that's currently allowed within zoning districts that are in the compact neighborhood tier. So the, the bars that are in yellow are the residential zoning districts, the red bars are the commercial zoning districts, uh, the green bar is the mixed use district, and then the blue bars are the compact design district. And the dashed line at the top shows um, the 75 units an acre. So you can see that this is a significant bonus, but it varies kind of depending uh, which, which zoning district that you are, you are in, how big the bonus actually would be. So this is a similar chart that um, compares the proposed heights, the 90 feet kind of internal to the compact neighborhood tier, and the 50 feet that would be at the edges of the tier. It compares those two numbers that are shown in those dashed lines to what the, proposed, what the existing allowable heights are um, with, within the, the zoning districts. Um, I mentioned the to be a little bit more context sensitive to single family neighborhoods that are outside of the compact neighborhood tiers. There's this pr the proposed uh, transitional height area of 75 feet if you're adjacent to an, the urban tier, or 150 feet in distance if you're adjacent to the the suburban tier. And again, the height there would be restricted to about 50 feet, which is approximately four stories. Uh, during our community outreach um, that we conducted over the summer, we anticipated um, a lot of questions like, how will this affect development near me? Um, so what we, what we did is for every compact neighborhood, um, we put together uh, charts, maps that compared what the allowable um, den densities and heights are under current zoning and compared that to what it would be under the proposed bonus. Um, I mentioned this just to 
just to say that these are available online, and if you have particular um, questions about particular sites, um, you know, we're happy to answer them. Um, but this is this is a good resource to look, to look at to look at the impacts on on uh, on sites that you might be most interested in. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Pat to talk about some of the limitations, um, benefits, and steps moving forward. Good evening again, and thank you, Hannah. Um, Hannah and our excellent team uh, did a lot of research uh, associated with the proposal that's before you tonight, and one of the things they found is that this type of program is most effective um, and in fact, really, I, I would say exclusively effective in real estate markets that have very, very high market valuations, um, such as San Francisco, New York, um, uh, and, and places of that magnitude. And um, that's because the very high market rents, as Hannah alluded to under the describing the theory behind this, allow for a market rate developer to offset or write down the cost of the affordable units by charging very high market rents. Um, we do have much higher rents than we've had five years ago or 10 years ago in Durham, but they're still not at the level that fully offset the cost of things like steel frame construction, which is required when you get over about 50 feet or four stories, uh, and um, parking decks, uh, structured parking. The, uh, for these large projects that would take advantage of this density bonus that Hannah presented to you, um, the underwriting standards of banks and lenders, the market, as well as our regulations, uh, would require um, those types of um, improvements, which are very, very expensive and very hard to, for the zoning tool to completely offset the cost of. Uh, and so there's still a revenue gap that exists, and that is a substantial limitation in what you heard tonight. And it just it ties back to the point that I think we make every time you hear us talk about this, which is it's going this program that you heard of tonight is a great step in the right direction, but it's going to have to be partnered with uh, direct uh, subsidy <coughs> grant programs to be to be effective, because there's still a gap um, for market rate developers between uh, what they can make in these extra units and the cost of providing affordable units. Another key point I want to bring up here is that uh, you heard about the six different. Um, future compact neighbor um, light rail transit areas that we call our compact design districts. There are very significantly different, as you all I think are well aware, market conditions, um, land costs, market rents across these different areas, Alston Avenue versus Patterson Place versus Irwin mm -hmm. Road. And that has a significant impact on how effective this uh, tool may be, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And there are relatively few development ready sites, and by development ready I mean that meet the criteria that you heard about from Hannah in terms of being uh, a zoning designation that can take advantage of this program and that are on the market and that um, um, that there's interest in, in market demand for this type of product. But that being said, I, I think we think we, we think that um, this program sends a real signal to the market about the community's expectation. <laughs> Uh, the the uh, something that the advocates, uh, the community advocates that have helped us with this program tremendously have have promoted is the idea that our markets are only going to continue to mature and evolve, and there's going to be higher and higher demand, and we're really sending a signal now to the community that our expectation is that affordability, inclusion, and equity and access are important community principles, uh, and I think also importantly that there are already current projects and planned projects uh, that may be able to take advantages that have a high level of public participation already. For example, Fayette Place. Um, there's not a full funding source for redevelopment of Fayette Place, but there are, is a lot of interest in that. And I'm just using that as an example. The current zoning on that site would only support, I believe it's eight, I should have checked before I came in here, but it's eight or 12 units an acre. If they took advantage of this program, it would be uh, able to be redeveloped at a much higher density and have a much higher amount of affordability uh, than it would without uh, the program. So. There's both market signaling and there's uh, immediate near-term benefits for projects that have a high level of uh, public subsidy or that are possibly being done by a nonprofit or mission-based developer. Um, I alluded to this here. I just want to give this for additional context. 
um, to the point I made a moment ago. I think it's important to spend just a moment here. Um, you see the household income limits there uh, on your screen for 60% and 80% of AMI, and then you see the market rents today. This is based on some very current, um, almost real-time data uh, that did a, a fairly detailed assessment um, of market conditions uh, in our future um, light rail transit station areas. You can see the differential uh, between um, affordable rent, which is shown there uh, up on the top of the slide, and the current market rents, and of course those are only likely to increase over time. So um, we, uh, what we're trying to do here is to, um, as a next step, is to look at each of these future compact design, excuse me, compact design districts, future light rail transit areas, and um, probably through a third party consultant co uh, contract to do an economic analysis of each of these to see if based on the market, uh, pro current and projected market demand, what is a baseline density that can support our minimum transit goals, meaning being dense enough that it can support light rail transit, uh, but not so dense that there's not some incentive for market rate developers to consider, to, to heavily consider using this tool. Um, this is a um, different, this, this is a, a complex uh, set of um, data points that we have to try to pull together to be effective. Um, our average baseline density in these areas now is 12 to 15 units an acre with our current zoning, meaning the zoning that is in place today. If the market demand is not above that density today, there's no chance that this tool is going to work. So what we've got to do is assess these areas for now and the future to try to make sure that uh, both today and for the future, <laughs> as, we imp as we implement our compact design districts, that we are setting baseline densities that uh, can take advantage of this concept if we're going to keep this interim strategy in place for the long term. I hope that all made sense. I'll be happy to answer questions to talk about that further. But we feel like it's a great interim strategy, but if it's going to work in the long term, we have to embed it in our compact design district zoning. And in the past, what we've done is just given very high densities for compact design district zoning. Um, I want to be very candid with you about um, this is a very difficult thing to accomplish. Markets are very dynamic. It would be very difficult for us to have the same type of information about construction costs and market dynamics as the market has. And so if we don't get it right, we're unlikely to be very successful in using this tool long term. Uh, another, another, there are other potential consequences here if we get it wrong, meaning if we set the baseline densities uh, at a level that does not encourage folks to use this incentive, we run a risk as I think we've seen over the last 30 years or so in our partner cities to the west, Chapel Hill and Carborough, where you have a lot of um, very high cost, very low density development. Um, if we don't titrate this right, if we restrict density too much in the interest of trying to incentivize people to use a, an affordable housing bonus, we run the risk of folks coming in and doing high value, low density development. We also run a, a significant risk of attracting only non-residential development. Presumptively, this would only be applied both under what you heard from Hannah in the future to residential development. There's certainly a chance we get only office or, or um, other uh, commercial uses and, and residential gets pushed to the edges, which leads to a next area of concern, which is if, if we don't get this exactly right and we don't create uh, a long-term strategy that provides the right incentive to participate in this program, there's a risk of development pressure on adjacent neighborhoods, which is something we've been trying very desperately to avoid. And finally, the um, FTA, which is the Federal Transit Administration, that's the funding, uh, primarily the, the federal funding agency for the light rail transit system, looks very um, closely at projected ridership for the line. And there is certainly a risk that as they continue to evaluate this and as we go down the funding uh, process, that um, they will con consider these efforts something that will reduce uh, density, the number of likely riders in these areas, and that could be something that could negatively affect our scoring under the program. So I don't mean to bring any of this up as uh, um, the sky is falling, but I want us to be uh, very thoughtful as we move from this interim strategy, which is again, interim refers to the fact that it's between now and the time that we bring in these compact design district zonings in the future uh, light rail transit areas, if we, uh, if when we apply the compact design district zoning, if we don't uh, get the zoning exactly right, 
there is a risk, and we, uh, it's something that we would love to get your feedback and commentary and input on before we go a lot further down this road. Um, so in conclusion then, um, the interim strategy is a great approach. It's a great way to test to see how this works and if it's the market responds to it, uh, and it's a great way to um, provide opportunities and options for the development community to pursue um, additional um, density th by providing affordable housing. But we are gonna be proceeding forward to bring you the compact design districts with the caveat that we will look at possibly modifying those baseline densities to embed this concept going forward. But we wanted to bring up uh, with you now the, the concerns about that and the risks of that. I'll say one more thing and then turn it over to any questions you all have for Hannah or I. Um, alluded to it several times, there's no way any of this is successful without being partnered and paired with uh, other toolbox options uh, to be effective. Uh, <coughs> I mentioned Karen Lotto is here tonight with us. A community development department is in the very early stages, and I want to emphasize that. There's been no drafts or proposals other than uh, concepts and early discussions, but about some kind of a program uh, 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 that would potentially be paired with this program um, that would help uh, market rate developers um, make, make up that revenue gap. Uh, again, that would have to go through a full process of evaluation by council and the board of commissioners uh, if, if the county decides to ado ad adopt that approach, but that is being considered, and I wanted to dis disclose that because we do think this is only likely to be significantly effective if it's paired with a program of um, financing or, or gap funding. Thank you all for your time and attention. Happy to answer any questions you all have. Great, thank you. I think what we'll do actually is open the, the public hearing and give the chance for public comment and then we'll have the commissioners be able to ask questions of, of the staff as we move forward. So at this point we will, we will open the public hearing and we have uh, one individual signed up to speak, James Chavis. And, okay, we may have more than one, so we will, we will get to the additional speakers as well. But Mr. Chavis, please uh, come up to the microphone. Good afternoon to each of you, <laughs> ladies and gents, and others that are sitting up there as well. My name is James Chavis. I stay 2813 Ash Street here in Durham and Pat 1 District 1. I come to represent my area because we are not being notified by the planning department when this stuff comes up. When I found about this in two weeks, I sent it out and I've been talking to people. How can we, the public, know in our district what our money is going to be used for and have voices in it if we do not know from the beginning. I hope y'all would do in 2018 what we have been asking. Oh, stop letting the community be at the tail, but start making the community be at the head of the table with these people that's planning this. Because this will make it better for you all to help make your decision. It will make it better for us to see that they are really working and listen to the people. It's not just their tax money, it's the people's tax money. And the people should have it. It's not the special interest group's tax money, it's all of Durham's tax money. So I hope as you're looking through this incident that you will tell them, please, go and get out here in the community especially in Pat 1, District 1 area. I can't speak for the others, but I'm speaking of, and let us truly know what they are planning on doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chavis. We do have two additional speakers. Uh, we have Terry Alibal and then uh, Jim Savara. Yes. My name is Terry Alibal. I live at 1609 Hollywood Street here in Durham, and I appreciate the opportunity to address the planning Commission, I'm here on behalf of the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit to speak about the proposed interim affordable housing bonus. 
I want to start by noting that this notion uh, for the density, revised density uh, bonus grew out of the coalition's work several years ago to provide Durham's local government with a way to incentivize the inclusion of some affordable units when new residential construction takes place in Durham. Our coalition has appreciated the opportunity to work with the planning and legal staff over the last two and a half years on developing the framework and text amendment that you have before you today. And we're grateful for their openness, their hard work and diligence in moving this matter forward. We strongly support the city and county of Durham adopting this interim measure to allow density around many future rail stations sites while incentivizing the provision of additional new affordable housing units within our community. The tax amendment benefits our community in a number of ways. One, it encourages greater density around our transit sites in accordance with our land use plans. Two, it provides affordable housing near station sites for transit dependent citizens and thus will improve transit ridership. And three, by providing affordable housing near transit stations, it will reduce commuter demands on our transportation system, ease congestion, and promote better air and water quality. The proposed text amendment provides strong benefits and incentives to a new developer of multifamily housing or a developer of new multifamily housing in several ways. As you've heard, the density bonus can now be three, four, even five times the number of units that are allowed under existing zoning, which means greater profitability uh, for these projects. The parking requirement changes from two spaces to whatever the developer deems commercially necessary, reasonable, which can mean significant cost savings and structured parking cost. And three, the process, as you've also heard, would be an administrative review of proposals, thus a much faster, more certain, less time consuming, and less contentious process. However, there are two important aspects of this draft for this amendment that we have serious reservations about. I will cover the first and Jim Savar will speak to the second. The adopted goal of the city and county is for at least 15% of the residential units near the transit sites to be affordable to citizens with incomes of 60% and below the area median income. The draft only requires that 15% of the new units be affordable to folks with a 70% and below AMI. This would virtually eliminate those at 60% of the AMI, and we'll go to say more on this. And let me just say a few words about who, who would be eliminated in this process. <laughs> For example, in Durham, uh, a carpenter at 49% of AMI, a paramedic at 51%, uh, a firefighter at 55% or a teacher with six years of experience in the Durham public school system at 59%. It would be very difficult for these, these kinds of folks to be able to afford the new affordable units that will uh, result uh, with the passage of this uh, amendment as presented. I'm going to ask Jim then to make some additional points for us. Thank you. Mr. Savara? Thank you. Jim Savara, 1114 Woodburn Road. Uh, let me just make a, a, a comment to respond to the presentation that you heard. There was the indication uh, that uh, this specific proposal, uh, which Terry has expressed concern about, backing away from the 60% requirement, uh, was, uh, was developed in part based on feedback from the city council and the council county commission. Uh, I was at the work sessions when, both, when this issue was discussed, and I would not say there was any clear feedback uh, from the council, and insofar as members spoke on it, it was former members of the council who spoke uh, on, on possible move forward. Only two of the commissioners gave any indication of their preference, and they said, we want something that works, and, and there was no public discussion at that time. So uh, I think this still needs to be viewed as, as wide open. Uh, I will continue comments that you may sound familiar because they came in a message to you uh, from Wibgali, a, a letter uh, re reflecting the, the views that the Coalition of Affordable Housing and Transit has taken up to this point. Um, as Terry said, we've been working with, with planning for over two years, but always discussing this incentive to be used with 
the expectation that 60% uh, AMI would be the affordable housing limit for 15% of the units. We have asked the planning staff for evidence or facts that support making this change, uh, this two-step process, and in effect, uh, lifting the, the limit to 70%. Uh, we will in continue to engage with the staff on this issue and to be in communications with the city council and the county commissioners about this measure in, in coming weeks. The second concern is with the two-step process that's been outlined in this proposal. Uh, the structure uh, of the process seems to encourage developers to come to the council with uh, unreasonable demands for assistance uh, if they're going to cooperate and, and provide 60% units. Uh, in effect, they can, if they don't get as much money as they're asking for, then they can choose to provide the units at 70% instead. This seems to us to be the wrong incentives to build into this program. Uh, we, should, we should maintain 60% uh, and, uh, and then look for the tools to make that work. Uh, having the straightforward standard of 60% for the affordable unit seems to be the wiser course of action. Uh, at this point in time, we would ask the planning board uh, not to delay consideration for this amendment. Uh, we had to say we were opposed. We're not in opposition, but just uh, have concerns about these, these, these two specific points. Uh, we hope that the affordable housing bonus will be put in place soon, and there are several more months of consideration and approvals ahead. At the same time, we also urge you uh, to express your concern with weakening of the 60% AMI standard, uh, absent clear evidence that the 70% AMI approach will be more effective in achieving the creation of new affordable housing in Durham. For all along, until, again, just a week or so ago, we thought there were three options, the first of which was to hold to that 60%. Uh, we would like to close with restating the basic goal of this ordinance, which is to help ensure that the people who need transit most are able to live close to transit stations. We recognize that in Durham, we are just beginning to forge the tools to produce new affordable housing units in our opinion, we may, not, we may often need to use additional tools in our toolbox to reach this goal, including public uh, or reserve land, parking concessions, and other infrastructure improvements, public funding, and, and other approaches. But we believe that the affordable housing bonus can be a powerful tool to help us incentivize private developers uh, to provide affordable housing when new housing is built. So let's look for these and try out these tools uh, rather than lowering our sights uh, and only trying to get 70% AMI into, the, uh, in, into these units. As, uh, as we have heard, as the light rail gets closer, as construction begins, rents are going to go up and the tools may not be needed at that point uh, in order to, to meet the 60% limit. Uh, I think it's also important to recognize that this is a more robust approach than we used in the past. It is also a new approach uh, that we have not used before. For the first time, we will be linking up zoning to the provision of affordable housing. Uh, the old approaches didn't work. Uh, there was that promise of additional units, uh, but up zoning, higher density was approved by the council and the commission anyway. Uh, so it wasn't necessary uh, to, uh, to include affordable units in order, to, in order to get that higher density. From this point forward, higher density needs to include affordable housing. Um, it's important to send the message. Let's send the right message uh, to the community, to developers, uh, to those who are advocates of, uh, of, of meeting, um, addressing this serious need, uh, and hold to that 60% AMI goal. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to give the opportunity if there's anyone else who would like to speak during the public comment period on this issue. Great, seeing none, we will close the public comment period and I would invite uh, commissioners, anyone who would like to ask any questions. Great, uh, Commissioner Johnson, would you like to start? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, and thank you to uh, members of the planning department who presented tonight and comments from the public. Uh, I have a series of questions, but I'll be quick in, in trying to get some clarifications around a couple things. So to Pat, Mr. the director, and or Hannah, uh, just 
in regards to the term interim, do you have, uh, is that defined in regards to a timeline of what does interim mean before you re uh, reassess it for a longer term assessment? Mm -hmm. Uh, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Commissioner Johnson, that's a very good question. I don't feel like I did a very good job um, of explaining that in my presentation. The term interim refers to the fact that um, pursuant to the 2005 Comprehensive Plan that was adopted by City Council and the Board of Commissioners, we and the Planning Department have been tasked with applying what are called compact design districts to these uh, six future light rail transit station areas. And the concept model originally behind those, and we've applied it, um, those regulations downtown and 9th Street. Mm -hmm. um, is to have uh, very limited restrictions on density or use in order to attract um, uh, high quality, high density, transit supportive uh, uses. 18 or 24 hour activity, live, work, play, um, high rise development, um, so that the, the ridership will be there for the train and that we'll have the type of economic activity that makes those areas successful. Um, the, um, in light of the concerns about affordable housing, we have uh, decided to look at, rather than applying the traditional compact design zoning, which allows very, very high densities, has minimum restrictions on density, a lower density level. And so the interim refers to the time between today and the time that we, and here's a, time, a slide uh, that depicts the timelines in front of you, where we propose to uh, work with the neighborhood to develop and then bring to you all and council the application of these design districts. Did that answer your question? Uh, I, I think so. So, uh, and this this parallels uh, comment, uh, Mr. Shavis, uh, the gentleman from the public may. So, so when you're saying that interim to the time that you engage with the community, is that the initial conversations you, you're going to start having? So on this chart, the red bars, basically signals in 2020, 2021, you will start having conversations with community members from the, Lee, from the Lee Village community about what you've learned or whatever that uh, that the start of that communication is with the community. The short answer is yes. So there, there will be some public engagement in advance of where the red bar begins, some initial outreach, just getting initial um, feedback, engagement with the community, um, getting to know the stakeholders and partners. For example, in Patterson Place, you know, we've already been out and had several preliminary meetings, but there wouldn't be likely any action until at least 2018. Uh, that's helpful. Just, just, I'm just trying to clarify. Yeah. And a uh, follow-up question is, uh, in your, in your uh, two-step process, you say, uh, you note that the initial step is to, uh, for the elected body to entertain the opportunity to participate in the request from applicant developer or whatnot. So is, am I hearing from, what, from that? comment or statement that basically the elected body will be asked to pony up direct funds for whatever project to take advantage of, to participate in this density bonus. So it's, we want X amount of dollars to make this project happen and the elected body then convert, uh, convenes and determines whether it wants to participate in a public, a direct public subsidy uh, manner? Yes, that's right. That, that was suggested by a, a member of the Joint City County Planning Committee um, one of the speakers was accurate that there was not a broad consensus on that, but we in the planning department um, took that proposal by a, a commission member and looked at it closely and, and determined that this is a voluntary incentive program. It's not a mandatory inclusionary zoning program. We're not allowed to do that under North Carolina law. Uh, and our goal is for this thing to work and be successful and actually incentivize the production of affordable housing. And we felt like the only way that was going to be possible if there was uh, the least the potential for partnership and participation by either the governing body or by other nonprofits, grant agencies, philanthropies, or other folks. So that what that two-step process does is allow the, app the applicant to request uh, some type of consideration of, of participation by the elected bodies. And one follow-up, I'm sorry. And so with that, one, the, the initial step of that process is the proffer from the, develop, the applicant based on the 60% uh, income threshold and then if, they, if the elected body says no, then they have the option to go to the 70% of 15% uh, affordable housing units as part of the plan, contemplated development? Sure, that's a good question. So let me unpack that and Hannah can correct me if I get it wrong. When we say an average of 70%, I think what we, uh, working with our partners in community development and others, 
um, look, looking at other programs across the country that are similar in design, what tends to work best and be most effective is allowing a range of participants from 60 to 80 percent of AMI. The 70 percent is an average. So there would be a range from 60 all the way to 80, um, with at 70 being an average. There's nothing that precludes an applicant from going straight to the 60, but certainly if they're able to provide that level of subsidy and support, build the units and, and continue and make a profit doing it. But the, um, the 70 is, is an average. Did I answer your question? I'm sorry. So it seems to me that the 60 would be my, my lowest common denominator and that I'm going to come and initially ask for the most costly component of my development, which is making it accessible to those at the 60% level. So if I get a no, it means for me, from a developer, a, a money person, I'm going to offer it to the highest amount of rent I can get, which probably means I'm going to amp up to the 80. And so, and so, and so thank you for, for that clarification, because in my final comments, I would just say, with this proposal, it basically has the, the possibility of cr creating straight up losers in regards to where you are on the income uh, spectrum from a Durham resident standpoint, because one, most of us, I'm sure, if not all of us, understands that you know the pocketbook of you know the the city and the county is limited, right? And so there could likely be situations where developers come and ask for the direct subsidy and they can't get it. And so when I, if I'm a developer and I go back to do my numbers, I'm going to maximize as much as I can in regards to trying to take advantage of this. So that means that those in the 60, 70 percent income threshold level. They're just not going to be a part of the contemplated development because I'm going to go for the 80 percent uh, households that I can get that from. And so something to keep in mind is that whichever side of the, the fence you fall on in regards to this, that there will likely be winners and losers just simply be from the way that this is structured. And I get the, the intentions of what's happening uh, with this proposal. But I would like for us to be mindful that if we're go if the at the end of the day we'll basically be tailoring a bunch of, uh, uh, we'll be tailoring development projects or favoring them that will provide housing for like the eighty percent. The question is, well, what are we going to do for the sixty and the seven those below the eighty percent in regards to access to affordable housing? So that's those are my comments. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Ghosh. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I want to say thank you to. Uh, the planning department and community and everyone who's been involved. This is a very important issue in our city, and uh, I appreciate the work that you all have done on it. And um, I also appreciate how difficult this is and recognize that, you know, none of us know whether this will work or not. Uh, it is a change from the current approach, which hasn't worked. And so at least we can say that. Um, <laughs> having said that, I do have some questions about some of the decisions that were made in this and, and about how some of this works. Um, the, I use the comprehensive plan as the measuring tool, and one of the items that I, I didn't quite understand, my understanding is that we want to provide within, uh, you know, close to our transit stops, we want to provide 15% of the units to be affordable uh, to someone earning 60% AMI. And at the outset, what I see is that, um, I don't know, maybe it'd be help, helpful to reference. So in uh, the example given, example three, residential density, it's on page four of my handout. I don't know what that equates to for you all. But uh, it says the project's in the urban tier and 15%, that's 45 units of the 300 maximum units qualify as affordable housing dwelling units. Thus, an additional 45 dwelling units are allowed above the maximum 300 units, totally 345 dwelling units. And only 45 of those are affordable, and so that puts us at like 13%. And so I'm, I'm wondering, I, mean, I, I appreciate the tool. I understand what it does. I'm wondering what is the plan or, or is there a plan for the other 2% that we're now missing? Uh, I think 13% is better than 0%, so let me just make that clear. But ultimately, our comprehensive plan, you know, attempts to approach the 15% number. So that was one question I had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just, just for clarification, um, the way that it's formatted might be a little bit confusing because we did some restructuring to, okay. the, to the section. Um, and so places that are um, underlined but not highlighted in blue, which is on mine, um, are, exi are existing text. 
Okay. So, so the example that that you're that you're talking about is actually in the urban tier, and and the all the changes, the proposal that we're talking about tonight is for the compact neighborhood. Yeah. Tier. Okay. Okay, but I mean, I think the question is still. Yeah, and let me, um, Pat Young with the Planning Department, let me address your broader point, which is very well taken. There's no scenario under which this tool, either in its current presentation or under a long-term strategy by itself, that additional programs is gonna be effective in achieving the, the adopted goal. Great, I think it's important that we recognize and acknowledge that. Uh, I think that, that will be important to know going forward. I mean, it, this is a probably a better tool than what we have available now, even if imperfect. <coughs> and that was one of the points I wanted to make. Um, and you know, with this restructuring comment, I'm a little, I'm a little thrown off because I don't know exactly what. So some of my questions has to deal with uh, the additional height that could be achieved. Um, I just wanted to make, be clear. I think you can get a, if you're using this incentive, you can get 15 feet of additional height. That seems to be something that's in the urban tier now that you're now that I'm understanding a little bit more how it's structured. But uh, the question I had is, you know, you so when you say you can get up to 75 dwelling units per acre, that's like theoretical. You couldn't actually achieve that because you know, you'd be limited by height and things like that. Is that the case or? Well, we are, we are proposing additional height increases as well, up to 90 feet to, again, kind of help to accommodate the amount of density that, that there might be. Um, the 15 feet additional, I think, is built into the compact design district, the one that's already in place in 9th Street. Okay. All right, that actually, that clarifies a lot. Yep. I, that, that makes sense to me. Um, all right, that helps. Thank you very much. Those are all my questions right now. Great, thank you, Commissioner Ghosh. And Commissioner Ghosh, thank you for wearing that sweater tonight as well. I just got a really good look <laughs> at that for, you, for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Bryan. Thank you. I want to start with a few questions just about AMI in general. Yeah. My understanding is, is that what we're dealing with the AMI is for the Durham, Chapel Hill, Carborough metropolitan area. Is that correct? So we're skewed right off the bat. Yes, that's correct. Um, that That's the way it's measured. It's the housing, the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development collects that data in conjunction with the census. And uh, that that's the area that we're required to utilize. Okay. Um, and another question I had about it, an example that Hannah sent me, uh, it seemed like that AMI varied depending on the number of people in the household, and I don't really understand that. Good evening, um, Karen Lotto, uh, Community Development. So, um, area median income is a is a standard that is used by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and so it's a standard that we use to um, basically determine eligibility for affordable housing programs and affordable housing um, finan financing. And so every year, um, HUD and the Census Bureau do a survey. They establish median income for the community for us, as you've, as you've indicated, it's Durham, Orange County, MSA. And then they adjust that by household size. So area median income for a one person, so 30% of area median income for a one person household is um, I think somewhere around sixteen thousand dollars, and whereas you know, thirty percent of our median income for a four-person household is um, closer to like twenty-one thousand dollars. So when you are thinking about this as it applies to a unit of housing, you make a determination and you you um, you choose the AMI level based upon the average household size that you think is going to live in that unit. And so typically, if it's a one-bedroom you say that that is a one-person household, or potentially you split it and say it's a 1.5-person household because you're allowing for the possibility in some cases it'll be one. And that's how you set the, so when we say that a, a unit is affordable at 70% of area median income, we are factoring in both what the AMI level is for the community as well as the household size that we think the unit is appropriate for. Okay, well, the reason I was asking, I got confused because let's say you have a single person living or you in affordable housing has one person and they may have a certain income. But let's say you had a single mother with two children. Correct. That's three people in the household, but still you're probably only got that same low income. And we don't... And how we don't, does that work? So the way it would work for the purposes of this program, 
the way it would work is we would say um, that the unit, so we'd pick a two bedroom. We would say, we'd establish rules for the program that says <coughs> the rent for that income, for that unit, will be based upon either a two person household, a three person household, mm. or some, you know, something in between. And that would be the rules for the unit. The rent on the unit would be set, and then whoever wants to rent that unit <coughs> would have to be below 70% um, of area median income for their household size. So if that mother with two kids wanted to rent that unit, so long as she met the income level, then, um, then she could rent the unit. Okay. Thank you. Uh I also want to have a question about the administrative approval process. Um, it almost sounds like that we start with a site plan and do the, you know, figure out the affordable housing part of it and then do the rezoning as administratively. Am I getting that right? Yeah, Commissioner Bryan, what's being proposed here is that um, between now and the time that we bring you all and, and the commissioners and uh, city council, the uh, compact design district zoning for these areas, the, the base zoning could be used to achieve these densities without any rezoning at all. So it, could be, it would be done through a site plan, as you suggested. Okay, thank you. Uh, final question. Um, I know that there were differences between this text amendment and another one that we'll hear later. Uh, have you looked at any of the changes that the other text amendment proposed to see how they would fit? We have. We've had similar people working on, you know, both of these teams. Okay. Um, so we are, we are aware of the changes that are being proposed through Omnibus. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so that leads to my final question. Once you get this worked out, is there any chance, even just as a letting us know what happened, that the Planning Commission could see this again? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. Commissioner Miller? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have want to start with some questions. Uh, quite frankly, I'm a little confused, and it's probably just me, about how height limits work at the edges of compact neighborhoods and design districts uh, and how the bonus will affect those height limits. And let me start by saying what I think the rule is for today, or, and I realize that we've, we are either in the process of changing it or have changed it. But if, uh, if we're, say, in the design district, we're in, uh, say, an S2 we're next to uh, out just outside the district. We've got a, a traditional single-family neighborhood. Uh, the height limit there would be, uh, I've forgotten now, is it 45 or 50 feet? But if you get within 75 feet of the back lot line or the border or boundary of the district, then the height limit is 35 feet. Would that 35-foot height limit inside that 75-foot transitional area uh, could you change that by using the affordable housing density bonus? I may have gotten a little lost in your question. Um, to, to well, I tried to make it as complicated as I could. <laughs> um, I wanted you to sh be able to show off your technical ex <laughs> And fail. Um, <laughs> well, the failure what is I can, What I can say is we tried to make this bonus as consistent as possible with what was already adopted in the um, compact design district in the S2. So um, the bonus that is um, applied uh, in the in the in the compact design district, the S2, um, I think is an additional 15 feet, and that's what you would get here as well. Would you get that in that 75-foot transitional area? I, I, it's the same distance. So you could go up to 50 district. feet in that area, but only by using this bonus. Correct. All right. Thank you. That helps. Um, so my next question concerns, actually, the question that George asked that I had not considered before. Uh, so, uh, with the flexible nature of AMI based upon ha who it applies to, 
uh, and the idea that we have if all different types of units that might be affordable from efficiencies up to, I suppose, four bedrooms uh, in the standard marketplace. Do we have a chart or something somewhere that tells us how to work that out? Because it's not reposed in this ordinance, and I don't know what the standard is for judging the acceptability of or or whether or not we've met the, the standard here. I don't like standards that exist outside ordinances. And these either got to be in the ordinance or it's got to be a, a standard reference that's adopted by reference, and I don't see a reference here. So, um, Watch, I'll defer to Hannah and question of um, whether what has been included. If not, I, I would say, the, in general rule, that this would be, um, well, for the AMI levels are going to change every year. So the actual numbers you wouldn't put into an ordinance, but you could, you could, you could target the actual but, AMI But levels. there's an agency that's telling us what the AMI is, and we could, in, we could incorporate that and even future changes into that. We could, we could incorporate that in future yeah, changes. That's, that's can, the simple part. We can it's tying it to units. No, uh, somebody's got to make a judgment when a proposal comes in as to what units, what, how we're going to work this for the different sizes of units. That's, that if that's a discretionary decision uh, to be made at the administrative level, it's not lawful under North Carolina law. Um, so the, the, the definitions in the Unified Development Ordinance do refer to the HUD standards for area median income. Um, I understand what you're saying um, when it comes to somewhat of an enforcement issue, um, kind of incomes change over time. No, it's actually an, a, just an initial approval issue is what I'm concerned about. So I bring in uh, a mix of units from efficiencies up to three bedrooms and say, here's my proposal. Uh, it's being done at the administrative le level. Somebody's got to say, okay, you're good for the bonus or you're not good for the bonus. And there's got to be some standard that right. we go to that's empirical, not discretionary. If I'm, if I'm understanding, the issue is that there should be a specification of if it's a three-bedroom unit, then you're going to base it on this household size and use the AMI level for that household size. Um, basically, that's, that would be the term. And, and then rent would be set then rent would be set as 30% of that number and with an, you know, an allowance for utilities if we want to go down into the weeds. And so rent would be set for at 30% of that number and, and, and this is how it would be calculated. If that, if that, is, that, I, is that a... Right, in other words, it's got to be an empirical standard. We can't, we can't have at the administrative, at a site plan level, a proposal that comes in and says, mm -hmm. here's my proposal, I, I want approval for my for my bonus staff at my site plan. Staff has got to look and see, here's the mix of, of units, here's the mix of sizes, and okay, that's good enough, that's not good enough. I mean, if you tell somebody that's not good enough, there's got to be a bright line somewhere, and it's got to be reposed in law. So can I address that, Commissioner Miller? I, I think I understand and appreciate the point you're making. The way it's set up now has been since the mid-1980s and, and would continue to under this proposal. It hasn't been utilized, but it's set up this way. Um, is that the applicant would assert as part of the site plan submittal, yes, it is administrative, that they are taking advantage of this provision, which is in the UDO. There is a required annual submittal of income verification for each, un each qualifying unit that would be reviewed in by the Community Development Department um, under agreement with the planning department, they do this, as Karen alluded to, they, they do this with their existing federal programs. There would be income verification on an annual basis to yeah. ensure that, it, that it's That's qualifying. Regardless of, the, regardless of the unit size, it would be qualified based on the number of occupants. And if there was not compliance with the required standard, there would be notice of violation, civil citations, potential, potential injunctive relief, and other remedies under the UDO. Yeah, that's not my question. My question is, at, if, what is the standard for determining at the site plan approval whether or not the bonus applies? Is it written down somewhere that says how, how e different unit sizes that are proffered by the developer are going to perform uh, in measuring whether or not they, uh, whether it conforms to the AMI standard? And so I throw that out there. I don't see it in what, what was presented in our packet 
and I don't see a reference to a standard out there that it would be an acceptable incorporation by reference, and so I see that as a concern, and, and I guess what we'll, we'll move on. I don't want to take up any more time on that. Yeah, we'll, we'll investigate that further. I, I understand what you're asking, and we'll make sure. Uh, and so then provide information. I have a couple of technical points that I'd like to throw out there. I think the way that 6.6.1a, I mean, excuse me, b is written is confusing. It begins with the word unless, uh, and then I think it ought to say projects in which 100% of the residences are affordable housing dwelling units shall not be eligible for affordable housing density bonus, and then say unless within the compact neighborhood tier, rather than do it the other way around. That's technical. Uh, and then I point out in, uh, another thing that, that concerned me as I read through this is in 6.6.2b, the heading is minimum number of units required. And then it says a project may meet the minimum number of affordable dwelling units required by either. And then there's a one and a two, and neither one nor two grammatically follow the word either. And both of them concern AMI, not the number of units. So I just think that's a awkward drafting. And so that's kind of the end of my technical comments and questions, but I do have some other things that worry me. Um, we talked about this whole notion of there being an impermissible amount of discretionary decision making at the site plan approval stage. That has always worried me. We spent a lot of time flushing that out of the UDO. I don't want to start building it back in. Uh, however, I understand the utility and the importance, especially in our design districts, uh, where we have already finished with the legislative decision making process of having some way of evaluating uh, the bonus program at the administrative or site plan level. So I'm not against that. I just think we need clear standards so that staff is insulated and the city is insulated uh, from uh, essentially impermissible procedure under North Carolina law. Um, my next concern is this whole business about baseline um, densities. And I realize that there's a conundrum here if we, I mean, Gosh, some years ago at the JCCPC meeting, I watched the staff make a presentation of what type of affordable housing density bonuses work in other places. And they said there's two comp components to success. Um, one is a bonus ratio that is exciting to the development community, and the second component is um, uh, reducing the baseline density so that the only way to actually get up there is to use the affordable housing density bonus. And there were some other kind of sideline things too, like eliminate competing uh, bonus programs. Um, I think we've done some of that, but here I am concerned. I know that we are reluctant to reduce baseline densities in our compact neighborhood tiers because our fear is, is that it will make our proposal for federal funding for uh, rail transit less interesting to the federal government. Um, but I'm afraid that if we don't also reduce baseline densities, that we're creating a bonus program that nobody's going to be interested in. If carrots are free and they are plentiful and they are there for the taking, what is the incentive value of another carrot? Um, and so I'm concerned about that. I support the idea. I would love for Durham to have rail transit. Uh, I am beginning to believe that we're not going to get it. I am like, it's Christmas is coming, but I don't think we're going to get the train set. I don't see the administration in Raleigh being excited about it. I don't see the administration in Washington ultimately giving us the money. Uh, but that doesn't mean our affordable housing problem goes away. That's here now. And so I would like to address the problem that is here now. It is now more important to me than uh, attracting uh, federal rail dollars. Uh, but that's just me. Uh, uh, I would like to get at affordable housing. Um, which is another component related to that. Uh, in, Patrick, I don't know who, if you wrote this memo, I don't know who wrote the memo that leads into this. It was lovely and excellent, and I really appreciate it. 
and the issues that were laid out were great. Uh, and one of the issues is in our design district zoning, there's no guarantee that we're going to get a res residential component. Well, this has been a criticism of mine from the beginning. Our experience so far, at least with the 9th Street District, we got a residential component, but the market supplied that and it was timing and a whole bunch of things. Uh, we, it is not safe to say that, it, that the, the timing in the market is going to be the same way for the other design districts when we bring them on. Uh, and I would like to see us build in a residential component into our design district zoning uh, so that essentially we, we require a mix of units and that the mix should always include residential. It seems to me if, if we are trying to affect density, we need to have uh, each of these transit areas need to be destinations uh, for workers and at either end of the commute. It should be home and office. Uh, so maybe that's in the next stage. Um, and then finally, uh, I share the coalition's concern about the abandoning the 60% standard, and I believe this two-step process is really a false option. The developer who's not interested, uh, <clears throat> who wants to just jump straight to a 70% a, a AMI, just proposes something ridiculous, can't come to an agreement with, with local government about uh, local government funding, and then we've just blown 60% out of the way. And, and I'm concerned about the people that uh, Terry and the others described who are, I think that's, that's one of the most amazing things here. We're not talking about people who are on the margins of society. We're talking about the people who jump out of the ambulance that comes to save us. Uh, I th think those people ought to be the target audience of any bonus program we have. And so having said all of this, and because we couch our motion, send this forward with a favorable report, I can't send this forward to the council uh, or to the Board of County Commissioners with a favorable report, and I'm going to vote no. Commissioner Gibbs. Boy, and I thought I had some questions. <laughs> uh, I'd, but I'd, I do agree. I, I liked your comments uh, about transportation and transit, uh, but that's for an argument for another time. Uh, some of my questions have been answered uh, by some of the questions that came up. Uh, I, I would like to say that I do appreciate what planning has done. Uh, they are going into this. Uh, it is one of the most complex situations I, I have ever encountered in my 75 years. Uh, in the past, and I'm just going to say this about uh, affordability. Uh, there are people below the 60% uh, income level that needs help. That's just been <coughs> one of the issues with affordable housing, and it's all sort of intertwined and, and mixed in there. Uh, but in, I think all of us, uh, when we bought our first house, we probably couldn't afford it, but we had to keep scratching and punching at it. And that's another element that I'm sure uh, has gone into planning's uh, decisions and uh, trying to craft some kind of some kind of process to provide affordable housing and not uh, dissuade uh, market uh, developers who want to build affordable, uh, want to build marketable housing uh, developments, uh, not just housing, just any kind of development. I guess sort of what I am, I'm hoping to see come riding over the horizon is a, a developer, builder, or whatever who realizes the financial opportunity to build a whole development that would be affordable, whatever that means. Uh, everything cannot be uh, high-end 
Uh, but at, at any rate, that's what I'm hoping to see happen. Uh, whether it will or not, I don't know. But I do like the idea or the approach by planning to go into this thing with eyes wide open. It may not work, but we, and I hope we on the planning uh, commission, the elected officials and everybody involved. And, I, and that was one of the comments, Pat, that you made that really stuck with me is, we don't know if it's gonna work, but we gotta try something. Uh, there are, I guess we've just got to put our toe in the water and keep walking. And, and I, that's, I'm not even going to get into my questions because it's, it's probably already been thought of anyway. Uh, but, uh, I, I'm just going to end my comments there and I, I do appreciate what we're trying to do and, God help us. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Gibbs. Commissioner Al Turk, and then we have additional questions as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, uh, I have a question about the um, area meeting income. I, I, so I want to follow up on that, on some of the things that others have mentioned, um, and, and, and follow up on some of the comments made by the co <laughs> as well. The, I, I, this chart that you're showing, this figure, is probably the you know, one of the most telling figures that you have in your report. And um, I, I, I understand that the area median income is something that's used in all cities in the United States because it is a HUD, right, calculated um, measure. But it seems to me like the, what we're setting ourselves up to or so setting ourselves up to do is to encourage development in some parts of, of the city and not others, right? If, um, if this is an incentive program and we are asking developers to get to this 60% or even 80% um, and we're expecting affordable housing units on 9th Street or Irwin or even Patterson Place, right, they're having to take a considerable cut and then ask the city for, to make up that revenue gap. So I guess I, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious to hear from staff whether there's a legal reason that we have to use AMI. I mean, this is not a federally funded program, right? And so it's not, it's not a tax credit like, you know, that we use. Um, it's not the low income housing tax credit. It's not something else. So do we, I, I guess, I'm, it, you know, it, it seems to me like the incentives there are not, or this is not going to be enough of an incentive for developers to develop in, in you know, all of these compact neighborhoods. And so, <laughs> So that's one question about is, 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 do we have to use this measure? And then the second would be to the coalition. If there, if there is a, you know, somewhere where there's a middle ground between, you know, pushing for 60% throughout the, throughout the city and then, or, and, or saying maybe that we would accept some affordable housing units in other parts of the city that are not quite that low or something like that. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just, I know this is a difficult question, but if we are talking about incentives for developers, it, this, this tension is bound to, to come up. So I, I'm just, I'm curious to hear what staff or, or the coalition has to say about this. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Alturk, I think for the first question, if the staff could answer, and then if there's a specific individual that you'd want to call okay. up for the second question, we can do that sure. next. Thanks. So on the, on the first question, um, so the answer is, you know, we're not legally bound to use AMI, but we have to use a standard. Okay. And, you know, a good standard is a standard that is readily available, cheap, you know, doesn't cost us, we don't have to calculate it every year, and is, has general acceptance. Um, that is why we all wind up using AMI, because right. it, is, it is the standard that is calculated every year, it is generally accepted, and if we were ever to layer in any other funding into these deals, that funding would, would be using an AMI standard. Um, because that's the standard that the city uses for, um, for allocating its funds. And, and so it, it is the easiest and simplest and most transparent standard to use that we have available to us. 
If we I can't. Could, oh, go ahead. If I could just add maybe a layer of complication to that. Um, <laughs> the, I believe that the, the city charter um, that enables us to do density bonuses in the beginning might use an area median income it does. threshold. So by, by state law, that we have to use area median income to, in order to do a density bonus program. It's a layer of simplification. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll, I'll ask the coalition terrier um, about about the um, about the, my second question. Thanks, Mr. Alboff. If if you understood the question, feel free to just Thanks, address it. If you need yeah, to hear I, it again, if I get into okay. it, I, said it. I think it's real important to start with what the established what we've already come to, which is. Uh, uh, looking at 15% and 60% of area median income uh, is a real important standard. And the big concern that we've had in our discussions at the coalition is that the proposed amendment, as you heard Jim explain and talk about, creates kind of a convoluted process by which you kind of come to the council in order to ask for support. And it, it, it's encouraging working that system to get back to the 70%. So our concern is that 60% remain in there. We think it should be at the 15%. Well, are there compromise positions in there that could work or need to work? Perhaps so. And so if that was something to come forward, we would discuss that at our coalition and, and provide feedback to the staff as well as uh, to the Planning Commission as so desired. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Great. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Satterfield, you have not asked any questions yet, and then Commissioner Ghosh will, will circle back to you. Thank you. Um, there have been a couple of comments made about the potential arbitrary nature of financial assistance that's be, that would be requested um, from the public body and the potential um, impacts of those arbitrary requests. My question gets to whether there would be a formula that developers could use or would be required to use for making such requests for con uh, financial contributions. Seems like they would, the public body would want an apples to apples comparison and apply across the board. Yeah, Commissioner Satterfield, Pat Young again with the Planning Department. It's a very good question and it's a very significant concern. Honestly, we haven't gotten to the point of actually developing um, a detailed pro forma or spreadsheet that would allow that apples to apples comparison. I think the expectation working with city administration, county administration, and the elected officials, it would be to develop some kind of a, a application standard that they would have to submit and provide consistent information. We had not provided that, developed that, or provided that with this uh, UDO provision, but we it would be the expectation that we would ensure that there was at least a minimum standard of information about the financial need and and relative benefits uh, provided to council and to the commissioners. Thank you. Commissioner Ghosh. Thank you. Uh, I apologize if this has already been said, but the good news is it's not very, it's not a complicated question. It's just a drafting concern. Um, on section 17.3 defined terms, uh, the way I read it, I think it's meant to create a range from 80% AMI to 50% AMI, but the use of the word or kind of makes it one or the other, if you get what I'm saying. That was it. Thanks. It's relatively, you know, simple compared to the rest of the conversation we've been having. I, I, would, I would agree. Are there any other commissioners with any questions or comments? Seeing none, I would just like to say from, from my perspective, Number one, I appreciate the, the really hard work that the staff has put into this. There's a reason we've spent the last hour and a half discussing this issue, and we've seen this issue be worked on for a long time, and we have yet to find the, the way to move us forward. There clearly is no silver bullet, but we're, we're working our way toward finding the right solutions. I particularly appreciate, actually, on page 7, under the section 17.3, the, the minimum 30-year term. I think that's a really important change, and I think that I, I'd just like to highlight that. Uh, I still personally also have concerns with moving away from the 60% AMI. I'm not convinced that on page two, the, the, the two, different, two different ways of moving forward is really gonna get the job done. But that said, I think Mr. Zavara was very clear in saying that 
They would not like to see any more delay with <clears throat> moving this forward. I would also personally agree. I think we need to get going. Uh, I will, in my comments, I'm going to plan to vote to send this forward, but I am going to note in my comments for the governing bodies my concerns, and I hope that they will continue to look at this. I'm sure they will debate it probably even more than we have this evening, but uh, I will entertain a motion, and when that motion is put forward, I'm going to plan to vote in favor of sending this forward and hope to see some changes as it moves forward. Commissioner Bryan? Um, I move that we send uh, this text amendment PC 16 forward with a favorable recommendation. Second. Properly moved by Commissioner Bryan, seconded by Commissioner Al Turk. Uh, before we vote, I will leave a moment for any additional comments or debate. And Mr. Young, you may have been looking to make a comment as well. If I might, Mr. Chair, thank you for that opportunity. Um, I did want to respond. Um, we, we really appreciate and value immensely the uh, partnership and assistance that the uh, Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit has provided us as we develop this proposal. Um, they have been invaluable in terms of um, information, advocacy, assistance in, in every regard. Um, we believe uh, that we as staff have an, enough information about market demand in these areas, land costs and construction costs, uh, to believe that there is a very substantial gap uh, in terms of uh, financial feasibility for, th for this model uh, to incent production of affordable housing, that uh, lowering the threshold will make it less likely that it will be employed as a voluntary uh, incentive tool. And so we're, we're going to maintain our recommendation as it is tonight. However, I want to be clear and on the record here tonight that we certainly will advise um, Council and the commissioners and, and this body now that if we certainly would support and understand the desire to pursue the more uh, the adopted and espoused 60% goal um, with the understanding that we may need to revisit if it's not effective at incending development we may need to revisit in 6, 12 or 18 months following adoption and we'll make sure that we frame that out for the governing body so I just wanted to get that on the record and thank you for the opportunity to do so. I appreciate that and appreciate the diligent work of, of you and the entire planning department. Any other comments or debate before we vote? Seeing none, we will have a roll call vote. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Ghosh? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? Yes. Commissioner Satterfield? Yes. Commissioner Harris? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Chair Busby? Yes. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Kinchin? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. Commissioner Van? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Motion carries 12 to 1. Thank you very much. We will move to our, we actually have more on the agenda, so we will move to our next public hearing, and uh, we're back on our, our regular agenda as originally posted. This is uh, page Park 2, A17, quadruple zero 07, and Z17, triple zero 013. And we will start with the staff report. Good evening, Jamie Sunyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case A17, 0, 0, 0, Seven Z seventeen zero 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 thirteen Page Park two. <clears throat> the applicant is Robert Shunk Stewart. It's located within the city's jurisdiction pending annexation. The site is twenty eight point one eight eight acres, broken up into two tracks. <clears throat> the area was the subject of the original Page Park development, which was approved by City Council on October six, two thousand three. The area was zoned RSM and CG with development plans to allow for a mix of commercial land uses and residential. A portion of the property track A includes 288 apartment units, which are currently under construction. The current proposal is to rezone track B to allow 50 townhouse units and remove prior tax commitments for off-site track 
uh, traffic improvements which are no longer needed. This translates to a rezoning request of the existing commercial general with a development plan and residential suburban multifamily with a development plan to residential suburban multifamily with a development plan, RSMD. In addition, there will be a FLOM request of medium density residential to low medium density residential. The track is shown in red. Uh, there's track A and track B. The properties are located within the suburban tier and also within the lower Noose River Basin. Residential is the prominent use in the surrounding areas. The site is adjacent to the Four Seasons at Renaissance. Residential subdivision and the, uh, the current development plan, which you'll see uh, later on, shows various interconnection access points to um, the residential neighborhoods to the north. This is the existing conditions map. Um, and you can see under track A, it shows the footprint of the apartments that are under construction. And track B, which is on the right, <coughs> is the currently vacant lot. Also shown on this map, there are various stream buffers, a 10 foot no build area, um, storm drainage easements, a Duke power easement, floodplains, and additional stream buffers, and an existing turn lane to be abandoned off of Page Road. In terms of the current application track B, which um, is shown, the existing flom, which is shown on the left, and track B um, is shown in red. That is the commercial designation currently. And the applicant proposes to change this designation to medium density residential which is shown on the right in a orangish yellow color. That would be consistent with the rezoning request. And this map um, is our context map, and it shows the existing zoning on the right with the track B um, in a purple color as CG, and then the proposal on the right in orange uh, as RSM. Track B which is highlighted in yellow here, meets the requirements of the maximum pervious coverage and the tree coverage. Um, this is uh, a, a highlight of the development plan, and the de development plan um, shows the various access points, the building and parking envelope, the tree preservation areas, and the project boundary buffers. There are no changes to uh, track A in terms of impervious coverage, tree coverage, et cetera. In terms of a summary of commitments for track B, all of the dwelling units will be townhomes or townhouses. There will be a, a school contribution for students generated from the residential development, a minimum 10 foot planted landscape buffer along the frontage of Crown, Crown Parkway. And there are also associated uh, design and graphic commitments provided on the plan. In terms of consist consistency with the comprehensive plan, um, it is currently not consistent with the commercial medium density residential FLOM. That is the request for the plan amendment. It is consistent with the um, with 2.13D, 231B, and 232A. <coughs> Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances. At this point, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Great, thank you very much. Uh, actually, at this point, we will move to open the public hearing, and I will start calling names once, once I see who's signed up. Thank you. Great, Mr. Robert Schunk. Oh, you're coming back. Uh, good evening. My name is Robert Schunk. I reside here in Durham at 20, uh, 26270 University Drive. 
Um, thanks, Jamie, for a, a comprehensive overview. I won't go repeat all of those details. Um, in short, um, Lennar actually started working on this tract uh, in 2013. Lennar developed, were the developers of this uh, <coughs> of land here. Uh, we de uh, Lennar developed uh, 115 units in that location. Uh, and as, as Jamie said, you know, the apartments are mostly developed here. Um, you know, after some years of the, uh, the de parent developer looking to develop this as commercial, uh, he had approached Lennar to, uh, you know, to, to acquire this property. Lennar's intent is to develop this tract in the same context and quality, uh, architectural style as they did before. So um, continuity is important for that. Uh, re this request uh, does generate less traffic on the roads, generally generates less demand on the water supply. Uh, yes, it'll have a few more demands on um, uh, students. Um, the On this tract, uh, over on this tract, there was about 90,000 square feet of office and 29,000 square feet of, uh, of commercial previously provided. So when we submitted this request, uh, we did do a, a traffic impact analysis to, that was submitted to the city and the DOT to sh demonstrate that the some improvements at a couple other intersections, offsite intersections, were not required. But in 2006, all of the frontage was widened with a 14 foot out, uh, actually a four foot uh, cross section across the frontage with a 14 foot outside wide lanes. Uh, traffic warrant analysis was also done at the intersection of Chin Page and Page Road and where uh, the DOT found that a signal was not warranted. That concludes my comments and I'm available for any questions. All right, thank you very much. If anyone else would like to speak in this public hearing, this is your opportunity. Seeing none, we will close the public hearing and move to comments and questions from the commissioners. Are there commissioners who would like to make any comments or ask any questions? Commissioner Bryan and then Commissioner Johnson. Um, thank you. Uh, on page four of the staff report on the very bottom, I think there's a minor typo. Uh, the total number of res maximum number of residential units would be 338 consistent with what's shown on the development plan. And I also had a question about the additional plantings along Crown. Um, will the small cemetery that's there be screened? Yes. And whoever is in charge of that cemetery, I'm assuming it must belong to a family. They're okay with it being screened? Yeah, uh, we're going to be screening it along Crown Parkway. Okay. Yes. Uh, we haven't heard any objection to that request. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, to the, the applicant representative, hopefully these are two, easy, two simple questions. Uh, so on the, uh, the site plan, I'm just curious as to have you uh, contemplated uh, parking? Will it be surface parking or structured or how would how will that? Uh, all of the units will have garages, uh, similar to the uh, development Lennar built to the uh, west. Uh, thank you. And uh, could you just provide me, uh, if possible, what are the uh, anticipated uh, back rate price for the price range for the, the contemplated townhomes and the rental rates for the 288 apartments. So you have a sense of what the, the, right, the price range is? I, I don't have any information on the apartments. Um, the, the, new, um, the new units here will be consistent with what's been uh, done before. And I think they were the other units over there sold in the low 200s. Thank you. And Commissioner Harris. Okay, I need uh, staff. I have one question on page six. Top of the page, the latter part of the first sentence, the request is not in harmony with policy 2.3.1. Delta. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, just a minute, please. Thank you. Okay. Page six, you said? Yes. 
the latter part of the first sentence. The request is not in harmony with policy 2.3.1. Delta. I mean, one delta. Yeah, my my apologies. I believe that's a typo as well. It two um, policy two one three D. It deals with the residential defined, right. and this is a residential um, application. There is no commercial proposed as part of this, so um, I will make that correction yeah, that it is. I can, uh, with yeah, that. I can accept that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other commissioners with questions or comments? Commissioner Miller? I'm going to vote for this. Uh, for the primary reason is it nearly eliminates or reduces substantially a uh, chunk of commercial, which I think is badly placed uh, between two larger commercial nodes uh, in, in a way that's inconsistent with our comprehensive plan. Uh, so that's desirable in itself. So. Uh, that's the most compelling thing to me, but Mr. I have to uh, uh, congratulate Mr. Bryan. I'm usually the cemetery protector. So <laughs> it doesn't just have to be one. Any other questions or comments from the commissioners? If not, we have two motions. I'll entertain the first motion. Mr. Uh, Chair. Yes. Uh, I move that we uh, send uh, case A-17, quadruple zero seven, forward to the City Council with a favorable report. Second. Properly moved and seconded by Commissioner Miller and Commissioner Bryan, the protectors of cemeteries. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Any opposed? Motion, <clears throat> excuse me, motion carries 13 to zero. Great. And the second motion for the zoning? Mr. Chairman, I move that we send case Z-17-00013 forward to the City Council with a favorable report. <coughs> Second. Okay, properly moved by Commissioner Miller, seconded closely by Commissioner Bryan. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Any opposed? Motion carries 13 to 0. Great, thank you. We will move on to our next case. It's the Lumley Road Industrial, uh, cases A17-00017 and Z17-00042. And we'll start with the staff report. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, the request before you is uh, titled Lumley Road Industrial. This is a consolidated item uh, containing both a request to modify the adopted future land use map as well as change the zoning atlas. Um, quick case summary. The request has been submitted by Kim Griffin Jr. Uh, this is located within the county's jurisdiction. Um, this is a request to change the future land use map from office to industrial for two properties and currently change the zoning map from residential rural to industrial light. Um, this is for approximately six and a half acres. Uh, there is no development plan associated with this zoning map change request. Um, so any uses in the IL district would be permissible in the event that this request is approved. Um, an aerial map. Um, highlighting the subject site in red. Um, as you can see, this is located at the northeast quadrant of Page Road at Lumley Road, um, just south of where the Page Road extension intersects with U.S. Highway 70. Um, the subject site uh, does contain um, single-family structures um, that, are in, that may or may not be um, removed in the event that the site is developed. Uh, the future land use map, um, the left-hand side of this image indicates the current future land use. Uh, the proposed is on the right-hand side 
Um, as I noted, this site is currently designated as office, and the applicant is proposing to change that designation to industrial. Um, some zoning context as well. Um, as you can see, the subject site is zoned residential rural. Um, the surrounding area is a mix of that residential rural category, as well as RSM and industrial light are the predominant three zoning districts in this area. Um, some general requirements of the IL district. Um, there's a, the UDO um, establishes a maximum of 50 feet of building height for this district. Um, again, since there's no development plan, there's no way to proffer any commitments um, regarding anything, um, but it also includes uses. So anything in the IL uh, district could be permissible. Um, and there's also the ordinance establishes a 40-foot street yard setback for this request. Um, some comprehensive plan policies evaluated as part of this request. There were three um, key policies. One, the FLUM, um, and it should quantify the, the industrial would be consistent in the event that this request is approved. Um, is the request contiguous? Um, the comprehensive plan notes um, that ideally um, th these uses would be adjacent to each other. Uh, you may have been able to see on this map here. Um, <coughs> back one more on the future land use map. There's a slight separation along Page Road uh, between what would be this established industrial area and the other established industrial areas to the north. Um, however, taking that into context, um, as well as the infrastructure capacity, if in the event that the applicant wanted to perhaps petition for the utility service at some point, um, as I noted, this is currently in the county, um, so the site would have to be served by water and se um, septic service unless the applicant petitioned the city for annexation. Um, with that, staff does determine that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan, and applicable policies and ordinances, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. Okay. And thank you, Mr. Wiggins. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We will now open the public comment period, and we have one individual signed up to speak, uh, Kim Griffin. If you can state your name and your address before your comments. I'm Kim Griffin. I'm with Griffin Associates Realtors in Durham, 1816 Front Street, and I'm representing the Brooks family and the, uh, I call them the Page Sisters because they all have different names now, but they're both long-term residents of uh, the area. And then uh, about 10 years ago, the Harris family asked me to sell the property next to them, which is comprised of about uh, 92 acres. I know the Brooks has had their property under contract four times to residential developers that has not worked out. We've had several contracts on the large track. Sometimes they tied in the smaller tracks with the large tracks, and in each time, uh, but the builders decided they couldn't make it work because of the rock on the large uh, track that's adjacent to this. It's currently under contract to Scannell. They're large developers out of um, Indianapolis, Indiana. They're going to build warehouses. They have pent-up demand. They've been building them on T.W. Alexander. The um, Brooks family and the Page girls wanted to sell their property but not be tied in to the larger development. And I foolishly agreed to help them rezone the property. <laughs> now I know why the engineers charge so much. Um, the um, demand that we have had for this property has been small, independent business people. The uh, Huffman family was here earlier. They left. They have a warehouse in Raleigh next to the quarry near the airport, and they need to expand their business. They need a 10,000 square foot facility. They want to own their facility. They're tired of leasing, and they're tired of the blasting adjacent to their property. And they chose this site if we would get it rezoned for them. Uh, Durham Roofing uh, purchased Bud Piper Roofing, and they want to go on the Brooks's property they will utilize the home and then build a warehouse on the back. 
neither one of the purchasers want to be annexed into the city of Durham. There is county sewer across Lumley Road and there's adequate water supply in the wells at the existing facilities. As I said, this, this has been under contract several times. I think we've had five neighborhood meetings. We have had one neighbor show up. And the neighbor came and he met um, Durham Roofing people and he met Capital Air people and he felt very comfortable and he said, thank you, I'll support it, and he left and haven't heard back from anyone. So I have contacted other property owners next to the <coughs> ones uh, on the east towards uh, next to the pages would not work with us. The ones to the west would not, um, although since we have started this, one of them has approached me. Uh, neither one of them wants to go through the zoning process. They want someone else to do it for them. Part of the challenge about the large piece of property is the draw that runs down um, where the water tower is, if you will. And next to the water tower, there is a line that runs down to the uh, sewer lift station. And crossing that is about six or $700,000, I'm told, and that's why the property that's adjacent to it is just not suitable for residential, and that's why industrial people are looking at it because they can make it work. So I think it, it may look a little funny, the fact that we're trying to do two tracks, but I think in the end, you're going to see that this is compatible with what's across the street on Page Road between... Lumley Road in 70, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Great. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. At this point, we'll close the public hearing and ask the commissioners who would like to speak. Commissioner Al Turk, any other commissioners? All right, if you don't mind, give me one moment here. Okay, Commissioner Al Turk, why don't you get started? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'm... I think on the face of it, it seems like an industrial light designation makes sense in this part of, of, of Durham and this, you know, this, this area, but I am a little concerned because in the staff report, um, you know, the staff points out that there are two criteria in the comprehensive plan that, that this application may not be consistent with. Criterion B, compatibility with existing development, um, and then criterion C, which is um, they, the, the staff report says that development trends in the area indicate that market forces are driving new residential de development, and that would be to the north and to the east, mostly to the east of this property. So it, it's a little concerning because, you know, you would, you would have residential on, the, you know, the east side, on the south side of the property, um, and so, and then you have this kind of little gap between the two industrial light designations. And one of the, I'll close with this, that the staff report points out that there is no development plan, so we, we don't know if there are going to be any buffers uh, between the industrial designation and the, resi and the, and the residential, the potential residential um, uh, designations and potential um, development there. So I'm just, I'm curious why there's no development plan and what you you know, if, if you have specific plans for what you, what is going to be on this site. The uh, buyers uh, did not want to do one unless the zoning was approved. And let's talk about what's to the east. What's to the east of, um, if you, you, you all have a map that, that shows what you need to see, I guess. And uh, what's to the east is currently I believe rural residential, mm -hmm. it's vacant. Yeah, it it um, will not be developed, in my opinion, as residential. The 20 acres of it is um, in Wake County, and beside that property is the um, Aviation Parkway right-of-way that was reserved, and beside that property is the church that's on the corner of T.W. Alexander and what I call Lumley Road, but in Wake County they call it Fellowship Drive. 
So if you, you know, we're kind of like Winston-Salem. If you're driving along, you're on Lumley, then you're on Fellowship, then you're back on Lumley. So uh, that's kind of that situation. But I, I will tell you this, the market is, uh, this particular area, is, is just not going to be residential. We did uh, get townhomes approved across the street. We, um, in order to accomplish that, we had to do a land swap with some uh, Wake County folks um, to satisfy uh, different governments, you know, protecting their jurisdictions and things of that nature, which made no sense. The developers, uh, the owners of the apartments uh, across the street on Lumley Road to the south are in support. They have no issues with this development. They have no issues with what the folks want to build. Thank you. Any additional questions? Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chairman. So hopefully uh, staff can help me with the uh, the, uh, the question and the comment that was last uh, addressed. So it seems to be some uh, inconsistencies in what Mr. Griffin. Mr. Griffin is sharing and, the, and that his uh, sentiments is that residential will not likely be what ultimately happens in this, on this, in this area, this particular parcel area. However, the staff reports that residential seems to be on the horizon. So what, what's the genesis or what's driving that, that conclusion from staff versus what we're being told? Mr. Griffin. I'm sure Jacob Wiggins uh, with the planning department. I'll first state I'm certainly not a realtor. Um, so take anything I say with a grain of salt. But, um, you know, I, I think from a staff perspective, what we've seen, especially, and I think this commission may have seen it on Page Road as well, um, it does seem to be an area that has seen an increase in residential development. Sure um, you know, the case before you, there was uh, the case preceding this, uh, was in close proximity to this site. Um, I can only say, Personally, I have met with people about other portions, uh, northern and eastern portions of this property. Those have been residential discussions. But again, the, the, our department has no application for that, so I can't say with certainty. But it does seem, based on the, the site plans that I've reviewed in this area, it does seem to be that residential is the predominant um, development within the last few years. And, and that's not to mean that it's only residential, but it does seem to be primarily geared towards residential development. Thank you. Uh, so my, um, so I'm inclined not to support the application simply because, uh, well, not simply, in part because there is no uh, development plan with it, uh, and just hearing that uh, the um, developer, whoever it is, does not prefer to provide one without the rezoning, I think it's important to have a better understanding given that you're basically carving out a portion of a pretty significant swath of uh, property on it that's zoned for residential, and so it creates this incontingency, uh, whatever that word is. And yeah, yeah, the, the continued flow of a uh, consistent use of, of, of land, and so you're asking for something that's kind of unique here. And so the fact that we don't know what it would be and what it would look like in regards to what would be how that site would be programmed, I am not confident or at a point where I could just go forward with that. And then given that the, the comments regarding what seems to be happening around this area in regards to the residential, despite uh, you sharing tonight that that's probably not the case, it's just that I'm not comfortable um, with moving forward with in support of this with, with the limited information that seems to be a part of the request. And so with that, I'm inclined not to support it. Okay. Commissioner Brown. I have a few questions for you, Mr. Griffin. But before I ask them, I wonder, could staff put up their view of the aerial map, please? Thank you. Uh, in your letter to Mr. Wiggins, sir, you mentioned this, uh, that this site is adjacent to the 82-acre parcel that's under contract to a national warehouse, industrial warehouse developer. 
And I just wondered, on this aerial map, could you just roughly show what the parameters of that site are? I don't know how to use this uh, fancy thing here, so uh, I will tell you this. Uh, you, see, you see at the bottom right corner of the picture, that is the church. Mm -hmm. Okay, up above that you will see a little cleared area, and that goes, uh, is an area fenced in. That's approximately where that right-of-way is going to go for Aviation Parkway. Mm -hmm. So that portion is into Wake County. Mm -hmm. um, now, you see the, the subject property, and if you'll look to the right of the subject property, is where you will see mass rock holdings, mm -hmm. and that's what has made it uneconomical to develop this site as residential. And uh, you will see directly north of the red, there is now a big water tower. Mm -hmm. But the city of Durham purchased that property, and the owners of the 82 acres worked with them on uh, easements and whatnot for that. Um, Keystone Development had this under contract in 2005, the Whistler Corporation, uh, Albemarle Properties, MT Lot, KB Homes on two different occasions, Eastman, um, Wine Garden, is Lenar one of them? I can't remember. We've had so many that have put it under contract and have gone through the due diligence to try to make this residential, and every one of them says, I cannot make a profit building residential at this location, okay. and each one has walked away. Okay. I, you, I've sort of gotten a, an <laughs> idea of what I was interested in in my first question. My second question, when I came back up Lumley Road and turned on Page Road going down toward US 70, before I got to the water tower, I noticed that there was a for sale sign out with your name on it. And that's what, part of the 82 that's acres. That's part of the 82. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Commissioner Harris? Staff, <coughs> staff, I'm looking at Zoning map change 2.3.1. Baker dealing with contiguous development. How do you support this request? I mean, there's no industrial light anywhere adjacent to this property. Mm -hmm. um, so, in this case, I, I will say this is probably, uh, from my experience, probably one of the closest calls we've had in that regard. And being that the ultimate determination of whether or not it's consistent is at the feet of the planning commission and the city council. Um, in, in this regard, it's it's very close. Um, and I think uh, the commission and council has to weigh whether or not they concur with that. Um, yeah, obviously, it does not directly touch that. It is a very small strip of land um, that divides the proposed IL versus the other IL on the other side of Page Road. Um, but I, I will say yes, if you, Go by the strict letter of the law, it does not meet that. But if you also. Yeah, I, I don't consider that to be close. Understandable. Yeah. So I have a concern. Sure. Thank you. That's very noted. Thank you, Commissioner Harris. Commissioner Miller? Uh, I wanted to repeat the same thing. So when I look at the comprehensive plan, uh, if we were to change the comprehensive plan to make this uh, industrial, we would leave a crooked finger. Of, of office designated uh, property for the future land use plan uh, around it. Um, and so I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of supporting a change to the future land use plan uh, that when it was all over, it's not so much what we do to the subject property, it's what we leave in the future land use pl plans that says that should be residential. This crook, I mean, not residential, the rezoning says residential. The uh, the comprehensive plan says office, which could include some residential, and that's just not what we mean. Uh, the f future land use map, in my opinion, the result would be false to intentions. 
Uh, I would support this, though, if a request came in to change uh, the essentially the crooked finger around this piece of property to industrial two, and I agree with Mr. Griffin with the page road frontage of the, of the knuckle uh, now occupied by a water tower that makes it an unlikely uh, entrance for residential or even an office use, um, and the property is right there along Page Road. Uh, uh, their future viability as single-family homes is limited. I think there's, is there one? How many are houses are in there, Kim? One or two? On, there's a house on the corner. On the corner. There's a house on the corner that uh, uh, my understanding is, and this is all hearsay, it was purchased for a daycare. Okay. The septic tank of this house is on the lot next door. Okay. That is a different owner that is in South Carolina, they did not want to participate in the rezoning because they weren't sure whether, you know, that was money well spent or not. Right, like the I said, next I... next lot is bought, bought by a veterinarian from Charlotte, and I can't tell you what they plan on doing because they've never applied for a rezoning and they, they do not respond to my request to see what they wanted to do. But it... It was purchased for a commercial use. So what I would like to see is a request to change the future land use map, not only for the subject property, but for the finger uh, to industrial. And, uh, and if that was a, a <clears throat> precedent to this request for rezoning, I could go for the rezoning, even though we left zoned in there, uh, rural residential, uh, some of the finger properties because I I believe that the, the rezonings, once we got the future land use map fixed right, the rezonings would follow and then we would have a logical future land use map and a logical pattern not only of zoning and development. But until we get that, and it seems to me like maybe it would be possible to get people to sign on to it, um, uh, then, or maybe even this, the uh, this, this is in the county, right? Maybe even the Board of Commissioners would initiate a, a kind of an evening out here. Um, but right now I'm very uncomfortable with leaving it because it says this should be industrial and then but this little strip here and this strip above it should be office or uh, and, and that's just not what we mean. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. And any other commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Hornbuckle. I know that we're talking here about a future land use plan and 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 all this, but I, I'm looking at it at an, from another side. We're looking at a, a man, a, a, a business that's been in Durham for quite some time and a tax paying business. And it, and if they're in my understanding, Mr. Griffin, they would probably use that house as an office there, the roofing company, and this would be and it would be some type probably maybe a little uh, some storage out. Uh, but behind this he, he would like to use the house uh he has found a warehouse because he sold his downtown property and had to move and he's under the gun and he has a warehouse that is temporary but you know he he just didn't want to make decisions until he knew whether he was going to right. be able well, to use still the still a business and i think we should support it and i'm going on record as it's fully in favor of this plan i, I appreciate that also recognize the fact the other property these folks are relocating from wake county to durham and yeah, i think that that's significant plus, right. too great thank you commissioner hornbuckle commissioner gosh thank you i just want to say a couple things about this um so as an attorney i have worked on this site uh with mr griffin and these property owners before and i can tell you i feel confident that this area is not going to develop residentially. I know that all of the site plans and things that have been, um, yeah, zoning petitions that have been submitted for that larger track have been for residential. There's a reason that, you know, the cases I worked on, they didn't even get, make it to planning commission. Um, and that's, that's because this site is full of rock. I actually think that this site is gonna take a long time to develop because of that. And it's more likely to develop as non-residential, uh, at least, It'll, it'll, it'll develop as non-residential, I think, before uh, a viable residential project can be uh, 
can be uh, built on this property. So I don't have the same concern that staff expressed in the staff report uh, regarding, you know, the, the trend of development in this area. Uh, this is not, that larger tract is not emblematic of the rest of the area, which is otherwise developable. Um, so I don't think it's going to be uh, residential. The other thing I want to say is that I think we have to read between the lines a little bit here and recognize that this case is also about access to the prosperity that we have in Durham uh, going on, you know, elsewhere. If, I mean, you can look out in the crowd. We got property owners here. These are not developers. It's not big business. Um, and, you know, I don't know if, if people are aware of the type of uh, fees associated with filing a rezoning case, something like this. I mean, the fees were probably uh, close to $10,000 without a development plan. And then if you had a development plan on top of that, you're talking at least another $1,000 to the city and plus all of the professional fees you have to pay for it. So, you know, I know the, the staff report highlighted some of the, some of the issues mm -hmm. that they are not able to uh, come to a full determination on because of a lack of a development plan. But, I mean, a development plan isn't viable. In, I'm assuming the development plan isn't really a viable option for these property owners. Um, again, it's not big business. It's not a big developer. These are people who have been trying to sell their property for over a decade now. Um, I, I'm fully in support of this, this item. I recognize that it, it creates a, a odd scenario on the future land use map, but, you know, just because we didn't color the, the picture in real pretty doesn't mean the future land use map is, is useless or whatever. I think, uh, I think we have to recognize that, you know, there are instances like this one where, you know, they, they have an opportunity here to sell property provided they can get it rezoned uh, appropriately. And, uh, and that's really all they're trying to do, which they, that's really all they've been trying to do for 10 years. And they've, you know, they don't want to put the money into a development plan or anything like that. They probably don't have all that money to spend on that. Mm -hmm. They're not developers. So I would encourage the members of this commission to consider that. Uh, this is, these are long-term property owners in Durham that have been trying to sell this property for a long time. And now they have an opportunity to do it. Yes. The, the future land use map is a little bit odd the way they were, they've requested it, but I think at least I recognize that the zoning makes sense, whether the future land use map does or doesn't, the zoning makes sense that they're asking for, and it's going to help some property owners out in Durham. And for that reason, I'm in support of it, and I would encourage you to be as well. Mr. Johnson? Okay, so this is where I'm going to be more of a student here. And um, so question for staff, and then a question thought question for, for my colleagues on, on the panel here. So when the future land use map as it is today was determined, was the reality of the rock situation on the site taken into account when we're saying that it's being planned for rural residential? Was, was that even a, a part of the thought process when determining what we wanted this area to be or, and look like? Uh, <clears throat> Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. I can't say with certainty um, exactly how everything on the future land use map came to be. My uh, professional guesstimate for whatever it's worth would be to say that no, uh, the the soil or anything underneath the ground there was probably not considered in that designation. So quick follow-up. So if you, if you, if, and I'm going to put you on the spot and, and speaking for the Planning Department, mm -hmm. uh, take it for what it's worth. If you, if the Planning Department was going through the future land use <laughs> exercise today, would that be something that would be taken into account when, you're, when we're thinking about what should or could be a part of this area should be designated in regards to zoning and et cetera, et cetera? Um, sure, if, if that information is available to us. Um, I mean, we, you know, we have lots of information, but when it comes to something as detailed as to the amount of stone or something in the soil, um, you know, unless that's been brought to our attention through other methods, we may not have all of that information, so I, I couldn't say with certainty um, how that would play in this for this particular request. Okay. Um, you know, just because, you know, there, there's rock there. Okay, is the entire site covered with rock? Is it a portion of the site? How much do we really know? So I, I think it begets more questions that would be helpful to have those answers for in this hypothetical situation. So. Thank you. And to my uh, my fellow commissioners, so given the comments that I that we've heard from fellow Commissioner uh, Ghosh here, assuming that there may be some on, the, on this, this panel <laughs> that had reservations, 
give, does the comments about his knowledge of what's there and what's possible have, is that, has he influenced you one towards the other side of where you were maybe thinking in regards to maybe this request tonight could catalyze a different transformation of the area in regards to this notion that residential is happening over here in this area, but we're being told that this, this particular surrounding parcel will likely not become residential. So maybe if this, if something starts happening other than a residential, it can trigger other non-residential development or plans or ideas to come forward, which could possibly long-term turn this map from pink to mostly purple in this area. I'm just curious as to thoughts or anyone willing to go on the record and share their thoughts. And, and I would ask that uh, anyone who would like to respond could ask to be recognized by the chair. So I'd start with Commissioner Sorry Harris about and then Commissioner Miller. Rock does not deter development. Rock does not deter. It just may cost you a little bit more money, but you can still build on rock. So no, it has not changed my decision. Okay. Commissioner Miller. So first of all, I want to make sure we understand what we're talking about. The future land use map does not designate this residential. It designates it office. Oh, you're right. Uh, I'm sorry. You're zoning correct, designates right. it residential. Uh, and But I am less concerned about the zoning aspects of this case than I am the future land use map. And again, it's it. it I am, don't really object to this property uh, being developed for light industrial purposes. If, uh, but what I don't like is, is a future land use map that moves forward that, that says it is the policy of the city of Durham that that crook finger should be used for office uses. I, if When we change the future land use map for any purpose, it should leave a future land use map that makes sense for the property, the subject property and the property around it. And it is this issue of the property around it uh, that is giving me heartburn. I would have liked to have seen uh, a proposal that joined uh, this in this uh, the subject property to its industrial neighbors, either to the west or to the north, and preferably both. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, Mr. Ghost reminded me that I have met with some of the lawyers in his office and their clients about uh, the potential for residential development for the this larger parcel over to the east and they were interested in residential but they were concerned with the soil type being able to meet the minimum uh, unit count uh, demanded by the uh, the comprehensive plan they were thinking is there some way to get relief from that um, uh, because of the general soil conditions. So we could develop it, but we probably couldn't get as many units in there as the comprehensive plan uh, demands. Uh, and that's an issue that I think is something that we're going to have to look at sometime. But right now, uh, I'm concerned, uh, as evidently Mr. Harris is, is that we leave a future land use map that goes forward that says it is the policy of the city of Durham that that crooked finger should be used for office uses in the future. And I don't think that's what we mean. Uh, Any other questions or comments from the commissioners? Commissioner Gibbs. I, I would agree that uh, this, uh, this finger, as we're referring to it, uh, uh, th this proposal uh, does create an island uh, regardless of the buildability or whatever, but I'd I, I do think it should remain flexible. Uh, it should, I would like to see this whole finger rezoned from the north to the west, but I'd like to have uh, flexibility for uh, office uh, use. Uh, to me, it's something that could go hand in hand with whatever happens here. You never know when, uh, the roofing company may want to expand. Uh, I'd like to support this, I'd, but I do have one question, and I will be very brief with that. Uh, there is vegetation or trees around this thing now, and I know uh, 
a roofing company, uh, this is not going to be a pristine warehouse. Uh, there's there's just lots of equipment, as you can imagine, uh, and I'm assuming that this is going to be. Uh, I think I heard the term warehouse, uh, and probably some office in there, but. If there is some guarantee that there will remain some vegetative barrier, visual barrier, uh, even amongst the rocks, uh, I, I could support this. Uh, those are my comments, though. Mr. Griffin, if you'd like to respond, you may. Durham Roofing Company currently is on a lot that's less than three quarters of an acre. I don't even think it's a half acre, quite frankly. Now, it doesn't have a tree on it anywhere. It has a 17,000 square foot building and a parking lot that was graveled back um, around 1920. And it's been that way ever since. Now, the proposal that, that he makes for the roofing company is to use the office and put the shop area behind the to use the house as the office and put the shop area behind the house. That's his desire. Well, I, I think I will support this with, uh, but I'm going to advise uh, county commissioners, city council, whoever, the county commissioners probably will be the people to approve uh, to make this request. Um, and some other questions, but um, that that's all, Mr. Chair. I certainly understand and appreciate that, and keep in mind that there will be a site plan generated in order to get a permit to build on either one of these two lots. The uh, site plan must be approved by the city county, and right. uh, that, that will be done before any construction takes place and any permits are issued. Sure. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. I just wanted to remind the, com the commission members, this, there's no development plan here. There can't be a commitment like that. The site plan is changeable by whoever owns this property whenever they want to. The city can't say no. Uh, and so you can't have a commitment to, to preserve trees or any, anything else. You have to assume as a matter of law that this property will be built out to the maximum allowed under the industrial light zoning. That is actually a requirement of law. Uh, the only way you can accept an agreement to do less or even to use it for a roofing company uh, would be with a proper commitment in a development plan. If we send this forward, we, we are saying that, the, uh, that every use allowed in light industrial is appropriate to the full maximum extent that the dimensional requirements of the code say it can be used. Um, we don't see very many non-development plan rezonings. Uh, so we get used to this idea of, of asking for limitations and requests, but we've got to recognize there are cases where we cannot ask for them and they cannot be uh, promised. And our decision cannot be influenced by an understanding uh, that it's going to be used in a particular way. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Chair, I make a motion we move case A1700017 uh, forward to the county commissioners with a favorable approval. Second. Properly moved by Commissioner Hornbuckle, seconded by Commissioner Bryan. Uh, we will have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Al Turk. Uh, yes. Commissioner Johnson. No. Commissioner Ghosh? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Satterfield? No. Commissioner Harris? No. Commissioner Hyman? No. Commissioner Busby? No. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Ketchen? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. Commissioner Van? Yes. Commissioner Gibb? No. It's 
close. Motion carries seven uh, to. Yeah. No, motion carry or motion fails seven to six. Thank you. Six seven. Yeah. So just a reminder, this will still be sent forward to the governing body, but with an unfavorable motion by the Planning Commission. I will ask for the second motion on the zoning case. Mr. Chairman, I move that we send case Z170042 forward to the County Commissioners with a favorable recommendation. I'll second. Properly motion, a proper motion by Commissioner Bryan, seconded by Commissioner Hornbuckle. Uh, we will uh, have a roll call vote again, please. Commissioner Alturk. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. No. Commissioner Ghosh. Yes. Commissioner Bryan. Yes. Commissioner Satterfield. No. Commissioner Harris. No. Commissioner Hyman. No. Commissioner Busby. No. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Ketchen? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. Commissioner Van? Yes. And Commissioner Gibbs? Uh, no. Motion fails, seven to six. Great, thank you very much. We will, uh, you have a six to seven unfavorable recommendation. Uh, we will move to our next item. Thank you very much. Uh, the Red Mill Quick Stop, and that is case A17 quadruple zero nine and Z17 triple zero two zero. Mr. Wiggins has the staff report. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins again with the Planning Department. Um, the case before you um, is the Red Mill Quick Stop. This is another consolidated item containing both a plan amendment request uh, to change the future land use map as well as a request to change the zoning atlas. Um, the applicant for this request is Mr. Dan Jewell. This is a uh, site that's also within the county's jurisdiction. Uh, Mr. Jewell is requesting to modify the future land use map um, to change the designation of the subject site from very low residential, uh, I'm sorry, very low density residential and commercial to simply just commercial for the entire site, as well as modify the zoning atlas to change the uh, designation from commercial neighborhood to commercial general with a development plan. Um, the subject site is approximately less than three acres in size. And the request is to have a convenience store with a maximum of 12 fueling positions. Um, an aerial map of the subject site is uh, shown on the screen in front of you. The case area highlighted in red. Um, as you can see, the property is adjacent to Interstate 85, uh, where it intersects with Red Mill Road. Um, a convenience store is currently located at the subject site. Um, and that is not proposed to change as part of this request. The key impetus for this is the UDO requirements. Um, the ordinance in the CN zoning district when it comes to convenience stores with a vehicle, I'm sorry, with, with fuel cells limits one to a maximum of eight fueling positions. However, in the CG district, the commercial general district, one can have up to 12 such positions. Um, the existing conditions sheet from the development plan, which is in your packet, um, notes the case area um, and then the aforementioned um, convenience store located on the subject site. Um, you can see my, my mouse there, and that's the primary location of the store um, with parking area um, as well as the fueling positions. The future land use map for the subject site, um, as you can see, the um, Northern portion of the property is currently designated as commercial. Um, the southern portion of the property is currently designated as very low residential. Um, the zoning nerd in me finds this very interesting that the commercial designation is in our rural tier, which is also our least dense tier. Um, so the applicant is proposing to have a comprehensive future land use designation for the entire site as part of this request. Um, as you can see, the surrounding area is primarily a mix of residential um, some industrial and recreation open space future land use categories. 
Uh, the zoning context map, as I noted, the subject site is zoned uh, CN. The applicant is requesting the CGD district for this. Um, there are no other commercial uh, districts adjacent to this request. Um, however, given the existing use at the subject site and that that is not proposed to change, um, I think staff leaned on the side for this um, application that the, through this action, the applicant is actually bringing this site closer into conformity through petitioning to change the future land use map to the commercial designation. Um, generally, in the CG district, you're looking at a maximum, these are ordinance requirements, a maximum of 20,000 square feet of floor area, a maximum of 50 feet in height, and as I noted, the maximum of 12 fueling positions. Um, the proposed conditions um, look very similar to the existing conditions, um, with the, the one caveat that the applicant has committed to those fueling positions, the additional fueling positions, uh, excuse me, fueling positions. Um, there are no other commitments, um, at least my general understanding, can make other modifications to the site as part of this request. Um, comprehensive plan policies evaluated as part of this application. Um, as I noted on the, the future land use map, it is both consistent and not consistent. Um, the applicant is requesting to change the low density uh, residential to commercial to make this wholly consistent. Um, the continuous <laughs> development, um, touched on the previous case, I'll bring it up again in this one, even though it's not necessarily consistent with it, um, given that this use has been established and been in this area for so long, um, I think staff finds that generally um, this is, uh, through these requests, this is trying to rectify an issue. Um, so we found it to be consistent with that policy, as well as the um, suburban tier commercial development policies. Um, Having said that, um, probably no surprise that the staff determines this request to be consistent with the comprehensive plan, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that the commission may have at this time. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. At this point, we'll open the public comment period. We have one individual signed up to speak, Mr. Dan Jewell. Good to see you. Good evening, commissioners, and uh, thank you, Mr. Wiggins. Yes, I'm Dan Jewell, uh, president of Culture Jewel Thames, 111 West Main Street also reside at 1025 uh, Gloria Avenue. We've been asked by the, uh, the owner of the store, Mr. Richard Block, who's here with me this evening, to help him in his request to get two more gas pumps on his property. Also with me tonight is Martin Coulter, uh, my associate. Um, according to Bill Sparrow Sr., who I suspect several of you know with uh, Red Mill Nursery, who was born, raised, and lived his entire life within about uh, one mile of this property. The existing store was uh, built back in the late 50s, so it has been there for nearly 60 years. Uh, in fact, the original structure uh, that Mr. Block uses is, is still in, in use today. Mr. Block purchased the store in 2004 uh, and has turned it into the successful business that it is today. He recently added a, a small kitchen, uh, but when he went to get permission to add more gas pumps, he was told that the current zoning limited him to the four pumps or eight fueling positions that he has today. And then he called us. Uh, we are here this evening requesting the change to CG so that Mr. Block can have a total of 12 fueling positions, which is a text commitment on our development plan, as Mr. Wiggins stated, um, which translates to two additional pumps from what he has today. Uh, along with that, he would build a new canopy uh, over those pumps to be a little more modern and, and lit to current standards, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as Mr. Wiggins explained, there's also an associated future land use map request. Curiously, the northern portion of the property, which has minimal development on it right now other than a parking lot, is already designated as a commercial land use on the future land use map. Even more curiously, the southern portion of the property, which has been occupied by this existing store for nearly 60 years, is shown as low density residential on the future land use map. Uh, even though I can guess that it has been in place through every comprehensive plan that was adoptive and made over in the history of Durham. 
So one way to look at it is we were, are simply asking to bring uh, the future land use map into conformance with what the site has been used for since the late 1950s. We held a neighborhood meeting uh, at the store back in June. About half a dozen neighbors, including Mr. Sparrow, showed up. Uh, besides learning from Bill that uh, his wife dated Martin's uh, mother back in the day, presumably before they were married, uh, the only real concern had to do with traffic in the area. Uh, and also that the double, and the fact that they have a wide driveways and double driveways was also making it more and more challenging to get in and out of the site. So we have committed as a text commitment to consolidate those driveways and narrow them into a single, single driveway. Uh, and the trip generation analysis that Mr. Judge did uh, shows that there uh, is some additional traffic that would be generated with the CN zoning district, not necessarily with mus what Muster Block's proposing to do, uh, but that the adjacent roads are at roughly half of their available capacity. Even so, uh, we have witnessed and the neighbors know that the peak hour traffic in the morning and the afternoon has grown uh, to the point where it has gotten much worse in the last five or six years. They feel it is for several reasons. One, the expansion of Merck, AW, and some of the larger industrial plants, the good employers in Treyburn who are using this way to get in and out of Treyburn. Uh, the folks who live in Person County who now come through the back to get into Durham because 501 and Guest Roads and Duke Street have become so congested in the morning and afternoon. And also, this was quite interesting to me, they know that people who live in Wake Forest and are commuting to Durham and, and, and Treyburn are actually using back roads mm -hmm. to get into uh, Treyburn because 98, NC 98 has become so congested in the morning. And if you've been heading to Wake Forest in the morning, as I do on occasion, you'll know that's, that's true. What we have agreed to do with these neighbors, and particularly <laughs> church, is to lead an effort to get up with NCDOT and have them take a holistic look at this whole intersection of Red Mill Road and the <coughs> I-85 uh, service road because it is way beyond the capability of just one small uh, uh, property owner who's adding a few additional trips to, to tackle that. Uh, in this case, it's been a death by a thousand cuts, uh, and they are now very concerned about traffic at that intersection. The store is a popular spot for folks from Granville County and Points North to stop in the morning, fill up, get a breakfast biscuit and coffee, or on the way home in the afternoon. Uh, Mr. Block has been a good neighbor for the dozen years he's been out there <coughs> and provides, we think, a vital little neighborhood service center for folks who need to get a milk, bread, or various sundries without having to hop in the car and go very far. Um, I might also add that <coughs> Mr. Block represents the best of the American ideal, I believe, having emigrated from Afghanistan in the 1970s with only the shirt on his back and then working hard to save enough money to be able to buy this store and support his family and the half dozen employees that work for him. Uh, we hope you will agree that this modest request to add two gas pumps uh, through this rezoning and expand an existing business that has been at this site for nearly 60 years and is an asset for the community and worthy of a recommendation for approval to the county commissioners. Thank you very much and happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you, Mr. Jewell. Yeah. We will now move to close the, the public hearing. And before we move to the commissioners, I do just want to check in with staff on the, the proffer just to make sure that that was understood and is acceptable. Um, Mr. Judge may also speak on this as well, potentially. Uh, I'm Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Are you referring to what Mr. Jewell's talked about in terms of meeting with NCDOT to talk about that interchange? Um, at least, uh, unless I'm misunderstanding, I don't believe that was a voluntary proffer, uh, nor I oh, okay. how the City County Planning Department could enforce it. If that is, uh, Mr. Busby, what you're requesting, absolutely. Uh, uh, it, it, it's not, actually. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. This, <laughs> oh, okay. this is but, what happens when you move the affordable housing debate to the start of the meeting. <laughs> okay, so I, that's okay. If the, if the proffer was the, the driveway work, 
Uh, yes. I believe that's already on the uh, plan, okay. Mr. Wiggins, is text commitment so. number two. Y right, yeah, there is a commitment. Yeah, currently there are two entrances or two points of ingress and egress to the site, and uh, Mr. Jewell has committed to consolidating that into one, Great. one access point for the site. Thank you. Uh, let's move to the commissioners. Any commissioners who would like to speak? Uh, Commissioner Bryan, Commissioner Harris. Uh, just a quick question. Um, will you have uh, your fuel pumps, will it be diesel or other? Um, they, he already has one diesel pump. He'll be adding two gasoline pumps. Okay, because when I was out there, there were far more trucks out there than any other vehicle, and I thought diesel might make sense. Yes, yes, I understand, understand. Thank you. Commissioner Harris? Uh, Chair Bryant, <clears throat> and <laughs> she's my good friend over there, I, I, I am concerned about the zoning map change. You're not satisfying either of these two criteria. However, I am aware that uh, it's not in compliance right now. <laughs> this will bring it more into compliance, so I do plan to support it, all, although you're not satisfying any of the zoning map criteria here. Commissioner Miller. Dan, help me understand the buffer. I don't understand a buffer that is going to have pay, existing paving and buildings in it. So um, the, uh, the, 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 so what we are. Put that map up. Yes, I'm not sure if, if I'm smart enough to do that, but I will, I will give it a try. Development plan map. Yeah. There you go, whoops. Oh, I was there, too quick. Too quick. Hold yourself short. So um, what, what we are requesting to do right now is leave the existing pavement that is in place in place. Mm -hmm. the, um, the MTC buffer, of course, is uh, that wide zone adjacent to I-85. I'm not concerned about that. Okay, not concerned about the 85. You're concerned about the landscape buffer, I guess. The buffer on, the, uh, on this map on the south and to the east. The south and to the east. Where yes. it shows the parking envelopes filling into what I think is the buffer area, if I'm reading your design right. You, you, you are reading that. So uh, that, that there is an existing small encroachment in the area that's shown as the landscape buffer on the south side that we would like to remain as is because as long as the, the building and parking remain as is. And similarly, on the eastern side, uh, there is existing pavement in that area that we would like to keep as is. Again, his request is simply to put the two gas pumps in a new canopy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question for staff. It seems to me that when we expand a business and we rezone and change the land use map that residential neighbors ought to get their full buffer, shouldn't they? Um. Jacob Wiggins with the planning department. Um, I think in this case, the, we're working with the idea of existing nonconformities at the subject site. I understand uh, that, but the, the map, this plan also says that it's go, there's going to be a 50-foot buffer and it's going to have a 80% opacity. They seem to be in conflict. Sure, future, um, so this development plan will be establishing development standards for future development at the subject site. So anything that would trigger additional buffering requirements in those areas, the, the applicant maybe had to do some of that. But again, this what, is- What would trigger? Hold on. Um, sorry to interrupt, just want to finish my thought. Um, again, so this is the an existing non-conforming situation. So we, you know, it is, I would say, somewhat of an odd request in that regard, considering this is something that has been in place for over 60 years, um, and probably before we had much in the way of land use controls in this area. I appreciate that. I'm just asking about going forward. I read this, this the commitments on this map as being in conflict with each other. Um, I appreciate that, um, and that, that will be noted. Um, I do not think that the additional two fueling islands that the applicant is proposing is going to trigger any additional buffering requirements in those areas. Um, but we can, in good faith, allow the applicant to propose a buffer that doesn't meet the UDO requirements. And so that, there is somewhat of a rub, and I get what you're saying, there's somewhat of a rub versus the 
with the ordinance requires, but also the also trying to work with the real world existing nonconformities at the subject side, and trying to reconcile those two things and end up with a project that is closer to conformance with ordinance requirements. And uh, which staff's position is that this request does that. Mr. Miller, Mr. Wiggins, let me, uh, I, my understanding is that um, it, as long as it stays as is, it can continue to remain. But if Mr. Block were to come in with a subs subsequent site plan that did re knock the building down and redevelop it or redevelop that por portion of the site, then he would be required by the UDO to put the full buffer in place as required by the UDO. We simply wanted to capture and memorialize the fact that there's an existing encroachment in place uh, and uh, as long as he does nothing but a minor improvement, and that minor improvement being the two additional gas pumps and the new canopy, uh, that he would not be subject to pulling that out. But again, if he came in with a more substantial site plan, and this has been my experience in my 30 plus years of working in Durham, he would have to meet the full UDO requirement for a full width buffer. And that's my understanding. Perhaps a staff person could clarify that. Or Sure. Uh, Jacob Wiggins, I'm with the Planning Department. I confirm what Mr. Jewell said, or he said it better than I. This will establish um, a level of development going forward. Um, I think something also to keep in mind is that, you know, the applicant is coming to us and requesting the zoning map change. We as staff can't force them to make I, I realize that. I'm not asking. I'm just trying to understand. understand. Yeah. And, and again, this is a very, I think, a peculiar request. I think that's a fair statement to say. Um, so yeah, any major development in the future would have to uh, follow these guidelines in front of you, assuming this request is approved. Is there any way to put a note on this development plan that explains this so that somebody, some other dummy like me reading it will understand what, what's going to happen moving forward? Well, first and foremost, you're not a dummy, Mr. Miller. And secondly, yes, we'd be happy to do that. And maybe we can help craft a proper, proper wording for that. Um, uh, you could even just like say that it'll remain uh, as a non-conforming use pursuant to the UDO section, blah, 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 uh, and that the, but the buffer requirements will uh, obtain moving forward. Something, I don't know, something like that, because it would help me understand it. <coughs> I would appreciate it. If, if staff is happy with that or has a revised wording for that, I think we're happy with that. I'm not asking for a 60-day delay or anything. I just... But words are important. You're correct. <laughs> well, Jake Wiggins with the Planning Department. Uh, staff is happy to work with Mr. Joel and his team, I think, on a note to help clarify the intent of the proposed conditions sheet. I, I don't know if a proffered commitment is the, the way to go for uh, it. I don't, I'm not looking for a proffered, sure. I'm not looking for anything except for an explanation. Sure. Yeah, um, and I, I think that's fair. Yeah, I'm not asking for anything that's not on there. I'm going to vote for it. And I'm, I'm on record I just want to understand it. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Commissioner Hornbuckle. Dan, I just want to say, I, you know, I, 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 Mr. Block has. He's done an admirable, you know, he, he, he's run that. I, I was, I've known him ever since he's had that store there when he purchased it from Mr. Crabtree. And uh, it, they, he does, and he serves part of the people in my community go that way because we don't have any gas in Bahama. We have to you know, go that way. And he uh, serves, uh, he, he, he provides quite a service to that community and, and uh, I think we should all fully uh, support this plan. Any other questions or comments? If none, I will entertain a motion. I make the motion, Mr. Chairman, that we move to, uh, case Z1700020 uh, forward to the county commissioners with a favorable recommendation. Second. That Thank would you. actually be A17 quadruple zero nine. Oh, what am I, what am I looking at? Nine, right. Yeah, so um, we will we will vote first on the the A one seven quadruple zero nine uh, the motion as amended uh, made by Commissioner Hornbuckle seconded by Commissioner Brine. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Any opposed? Motion carries thirteen to zero. Great, thank you. Now we'll take the zoning motion, if, if you will, Commissioner Hornbuckle. Yes, sir. Same uh, Z1700020 uh, forwarded to the county commissioners with a favorable recommendation. Second. 
Properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Any opposed? Motion passes 13 to 0. Thank you very much. Same with you. We are moving to our two public hearings on zoning map changes. The first is uh, 251 Smallwood, that's case Z17033. And we'll start with the staff report. Hello, Jacob Wiggins again with the Planning Department. Um, as the chair noted, this is a request for 251 Smallwood Drive, and this is a zoning map change only request. Uh, the applicant is uh, Mr. Chuck Allen. This is also located in the county's jurisdiction. Um, and this is a request to change a portion of the, the site located at uh, 251 Smallwood Drive um, from office and institutional to industrial light. Um, excuse me. And ignore the part with the fielding positions. This is not going to be a gas station, um, at least not now. So the subject site is highlighted in front of you, uh, noted in red. Um, as you can see, it does have some frontage on Smallwood Drive. Um, it also has some frontage on a public right-of-way that has access to Page Road. Um, currently, the site is a, a mix of wooded lands um, with some cleared areas. Uh, the future land use map for this area, um, you can see it's primarily um, farmed industrial. There are some pockets of low to medium density residential, uh, most notably to the north and east of the subject site. Um, some of the commissioners may recall uh, within the last few months approving a PDR request just north of the subject site. So the zoning context map, um, and it may be a little hard to see on this map, and I apologize, the covers are very similar. So on the left-hand side, you see the existing zoning. Um, you probably can make out on your screen this uh, blue line stream here. So the portion of the site that is zoned office is this little area right here. If you look super hard, you might be able to see the, the color differenti differentiation. Uh, the remainder of the site is zoned industrial light. Uh, Mr. Allen, as I noted, is proposing to have a unified industrial light category for this um, site. Um, as was the, the case um, with the project on Lumley Road earlier, there is no development plan associated with this request either. So the, um, if approved, any use in the IL district could be permissible at this site. Um, also, there is no zone, um, annexation petition associated with this request. So this would, uh, the next step in the process would be to go to the Board of County Commissioners for final approval. Um, the requested IL district um, UDO requirements um, allows for a maximum of 50 feet building height. Um, again, no development plan, so potentially any permissible uses in the IL district. Um, there's also a 40 foot street yard setback, um, as well as project boundary buffers that are required for any development in the IL district. Um, comprehensive plan policies evaluated as part of this request. Um, the future land use map is already uh, recommending this site for industrial, um, so it's consistent there. There is industrial that is contiguous to the site, um, and there is infrastructure to serve the site if in the future they ever did want to petition for annexation, um, and there is adequate infrastructure there in terms of private septic and well service as well. So therefore, um, staff finds that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan, applicable policies and ordinances, and I'll be happy to answer any questions the commission may have at this time. Great, thank you very much. We'll open the public hearing and then we may have some questions for you, Mr. Wiggins. We, uh, we have one member signed up to speak. I am gonna get the last name wrong because I can't read it very well, so I apologize, Mr. Doug Jacobs. Doug Jacobs, apologize for the handwriting. Uh, together together we're gonna get this done. <laughs> do this. Um, Doug Jacobs, I'm a commercial broker with uh, Coal Banker Advantage at 1858 Hill and Road. Uh, I am here to speak on behalf of uh, um, Mr. Alan Phillips and his wife Terry, and their company is uh, Triangle Forest Products. They are under contract with uh, uh, Mr. Chuck Allen to purchase this property pending the rezoning um, proceedings uh, to relocate their company from Wake County to the site. Um, 
they uh, um, once rezoned, the uh, folks will have the opportunity not only to meet their clients' current needs, but the, the size of the site will allow them to expand uh, their, their business as necessary to meet uh, future needs for their business. And um, um, so we think that, that in that case, that the rezoning will bring um, the entire site in line with the land use plan and the uh, existing uses in the area, as well as um, um, create a situation where uh, a, an existing vacant site is utilized for employment purposes in Durham County, and uh, um, that it'll pave the way for uh, immediate employment opportunities for us uh, citizens of the area. Um, we think that in, in this case, it's a, uh, a positive not only for, for Mr. and Mrs. Um, Phillips, but for the local area as well. And we certainly hope you guys will agree. Be glad to answer any questions you guys may have for us. Great. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. We will uh, move to close the public comment period, and I'll open it up for commissioners with questions or comments. I'll start to my left. Commissioner Miller. Uh, there's a stream on the property that's shown on the map. Uh, can anybody tell me how it's classified and what uh, boundary buffers might be required, if any? Does anybody know? Jacob Wiggins of the Pine Department. Uh, give me just one second to double check. I believe I have that information. And then while he's checking that uh, for uh, Mr. Jacobs, so the, the way I got into the property was to run down the, the, the road from Smallwood Yes. Uh, and then through the mud, those are my tracks. Uh, and But there's another way in from Page Road, but it doesn't look like it's part of the parcel. Does the owner of this parcel have an easement or right-of-way in over that road, the one that's gated? C Commissioner Miller, that, that would be uh, Paver Lane, uh -huh. and that is a public right-of-way. That's public. It's public right-of-way. It certainly is. We verified that. Through but it's got a gate across it. It's got a gate on it because uh, currently there's only one user, and uh, they are the... Uh, a wholesale landscaping company that you may have seen back there. Mm -hmm. And so the gate was up. That was originally a, a private road that was dedicated and accepted for public uh, right away. And uh, uh, because they're the only user, there's never been a reason for them to take that gate down. However, there will be. But, yeah, so, so you would have access, that whoever develops this piece of property is going to have access from Smallwood and Page. Exactly. All right. That's yeah. what I needed to know. And. I believe it's intermittent, but I can't say for certain. It's either intermittent or perennial, which would be either a 50-foot or a 100-foot buffer from top of bank. Yeah, I mean, if, it, if it's a perennial stream, that's a big chunk of the property that sure. would, would be uh, undevelopable, and it bisects the property, which is a problem, too. But that's a site plan problem. Exactly. <coughs> uh, those are Commissioner my questions. Miller, if I may, um, we have been presented a, a site plan that is now expired that Mr. Allen had approved previously. Mm -hmm. It shows that only the very western portion of that stream, and I, I dare not say how far it comes in, but I'm going to. It certainly doesn't bisect the the parcel as we see here. It's it's only the the very western portion of that uh, stream is uh, perennial. It's jurisdictional. Oh, it's perennial to well, that it's, point. It's, so it's, it's a blue line foot anyway. Down to a fifty foot buffer. It's fifty foot buffer, and there there our understanding from uh, the site plan that that. Uh, Mr. Allen had approved is that uh, he actually had approved to pipe the majority of that stream. Um, so, all right, that's what we've seen. I was just worried about. That's why I was asking about access. If your the property was cut that way, but if you can get in on either side, sure. All right, thank you. I'm going to vote in favor. Commissioner Bryan, I was just curious about something uh, when I. Went out there, I went down the same gravel road about as far as the communication tower. Mm -hmm. And there's, I couldn't quite figure out what was on the property. It's sort of like a, a grayish cover that seemed to have a lot of green fibers in it. So so it's it's recently been hydro seeded. Okay. So that's Slurry. what you're seeing. What that's you're what seeing. it is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A lot of it got washed down hill with the last rain. Yeah. Great timing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the commissioners? Commissioner Gibbs? 
I do have a concern about, I, I believe you said that uh, the owner said that he could or would pipe this stream? No, sir. No, sir. Uh, Commissioner Gibbs, I said that he presented us with a, a now uh, expired site plan that he previously had approved that had allowed that. So obviously with the site plan um, process that the uh, new owners would go through would determine buffering for that stream that they would have to adhere to. Yeah, I, I just thought I heard the word pipe. I would hate to think that a stream leading from a floodplain, I don't think you can make a pipe sure. big enough. Sure, I understand. But anyway, yeah. that, that's my question. Okay. That's my only question. Thank you, sir. Great, at this point, entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that we send Z17-00033 concerning 251 Smallwood forward to the county. county commissioners with a favorable report. Second. Properly motioned by Commissioner Miller, seconded by Commissioner Al Turk. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Any opposed? Motion passes 13 to zero. Great. Thank you very much. And we move to our final zoning public hearing of the evening, and that is uh, NC54 storage has returned. It is case Z17 triple zero, I'm sorry, Z17 quadruple zero one. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Before we start on the report for this, I need to recuse myself. I had to recuse myself from the original zoning, and I think it would be appropriate to continue recusing myself. I gladly will make that motion, <laughs> seeing as it is not me that's recusing myself. Rapidly so I move moved. that we Second. recuse Mr. Bryan from consideration. Moved by Commissioner Ghosh, seconded by Commissioner Harris. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Enjoy it out there. <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. We'll start with the staff report. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. This is case... Z17000001 and C54 storage. Um, it is a, a text amendment. The applicant is Tim Sivers from Horvath Associates. The jurisdiction is located within the city. Um, the property is located at 1003 East North um, 54 Highway. Uh, the site is, is 1.9 acres. Um, if you recall, a zone map change and future land use map amendment was recommended by the Planning Commission on August 8th, 2017, to allow for 120,000 um, square feet of self-service storage. Um, <clears throat> since that recommendation, the applicant has um, requested some revisions to uh, text commitments on the plan. Here are a summary of the changes. There was a revised uh, new tax commitment on number three. Um, and let me just say that the, the staff report highlights pretty much the entire project um, from the zoning map change and the plan amendment. And the first page just outlines some of the changes. Um, there were no changes to the development plan and the, and the proposal on the site. It was relative to the tax commitments. Um, again, there is a, re a revision to number um, three to construct an exclusive eastbound left turn lane with adequate storage and appropriate tapers on NC54 at the proposed site access, um, a removal of a prior commitment, number four, to construct a westbound right turn lane with adequate storage and appropriate tapers on NC54 at the proposed site access, and a, a third text commitment, which was number um, six, that was uh, provided as a result of um, comp plan consistency with policy number 8.12H. However, <clears throat> based upon information that was provided to the transportation department um, and the planning department earlier today, um, we all agree that that tax commitment can be removed. Um, <coughs> Oh, the staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the applicable policies and ordinances. And the only action that would be needed if you found this um, favorable would be a vote on the revised development plan, which would be part of the zoning map change. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. 
Great. Thank you, Ms. Sanyak. We will open the public hearing, and we have three individuals signed up to speak. Uh, Jamie Shewelder, Tim Sivers, and Earl Llewellyn. And I am so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I'm used to it. Um, good evening, Chairman Busby and members of the commission. My name is Jamie Schwedler. I'm with Parker Poe at 301 Fayetteville Street in Raleigh, and I'm here on behalf of the property owner, on behalf of the applicant, Tim Sybers, and we do have our traffic engineer, Mr. Earl Llewellyn, here with us. Um, Jamie highlighted all the changes that um, I'd like to focus on. Um, I would like to just go through quickly what those changes are to the plan to actually offer an additional um, proffer here tonight that speaks to cross access and then explain why these changes uh, actually better meet the comprehensive plan policies and work with the Barbie Road retail rezoning that was approved by council uh, earlier this year. Um, so as Jamie mentioned, the, the plan was before you in August. It received a favorable ruling, um, but there were some concerns raised at that time about should a new commercial node be created in this area what would the new council do, and how these two projects would work together. And at the time that we were before you, that project had not yet been approved, um, and the projects hadn't yet had a chance to really work together because there was some uncertainty about what would happen. Since that time, council has, of course, approved the uh, future land use map zoning change, or future land use map change from office uh, to commercial, and has approved that zoning project so that there is a, a commercial node that has been created at the corner. Um, and that we believe our new um, proffers and the time that's passed would make these more consistent with the comprehensive plan. In addition to uh, that approval, the applicant offered a, um, a cross access easement where the council asked if they would agree to offer our property owner cross access easement and if accepted, they would record it. That was approved in September, and they have not yet reached out to us to make that offer. So what we'd like to do <coughs> tonight is to make the mirror offer of that cross-access easement, that we will offer to make the cross-access easement uh, to them, and that way it gives uh, kind of a belt and suspenders uh, approach where we're going to work together um, and try to, to move forward. They were not required to modify their development plan because they were already at council, um, and as we go forward, if approved by the commission tonight, uh, we would update our development plan with those change conditions and showing um, that, that commitment as well. Um, and if those are accepted by the commission tonight, we believe that with the time passed and those conditions offered, uh, we're able to overcome some of the concerns that the commission raised before and some of the uncertainty that was before the commission uh, and hope to leave tonight with a favorable recommendation. Um, as Jamie mentioned, the three changes are the change to an exclusive eastbound turn lane into the site. Uh, we are removing uh, former condition four and this existing condition six that you might see on your plan um, because at that time there was some uncertainty about whether those were, were warranted and based on our discussions with uh, Mr. Judge and the planning department, um, we believe there's consensus there to remove that condition six. Mr. Llewellyn is here to address those traffic um, conditions specifically if you have questions on that. But briefly, the, the, the changes support, um, support approval tonight for both the land use map amendment and the zoning. Specifically with the land use map amendment, one of the issues was that at the time we came through, we didn't have that contiguous parcel um, issue that you looked at earlier on uh, one of the hearings tonight. Now that that land use ma map has been aman amended from office to um, commercial, and we're asking for that same change. It's merely just a, an adding on of that new commercial node, expanding it by much less of a uh, of an area. Um, and that's consistent with policy 2.3.A, which tries to avoid those patterns of non-contiguous area and, and orderly development. Um, and second, the change from office to commercial um, makes sense here. We talked about last time that the site is really too small to do office or, uh, or other types of uses, and it really makes sense to do this commercial. And with the development plan committing us to self-storage, we're not talking about any commercial. We're just talking about a low-impact, uh, low-traffic type of commercial that makes sense for this, this parcel. And third, it's consistent with uh, policy 2.3.1E, which speaks to expansion of commercial nodes. And this wasn't before you before because the commercial node didn't exist. But now that the council has approved that commercial node, it calls upon the commission to evaluate the requests um, and determine if they've been integrated with the rest of an existing node. 
to promote pedestrian and vehicular circulation. And we have two commitments that speak to that. The first is we have a four-foot asphalt uh, path that runs along 54 that provides uh, either a pedestrian or a bicycle connection between the two sites. And now that we've offered the, <coughs> to offer the cross-access easement, that would also provide an internal point of connection between the two sites and to promote that pedestrian and vehicular circulation. Um, that cross-access easement also supports several policies in support of the zoning change, uh, and that in a policy 2.2, Point two E um, in the suburban tier were to discourage our auto-oriented strip development and encourage this commercial node. Again, now that council has created that node, this is just a minor expansion. <clears throat> it's a complementary expansion of that uh, service-oriented residential services uh, area, and this offers just an, a commercial expansion that makes sense and works with that type of use. Uh, they also offered the Barbie Road Retail some limitations on their footprint. I think there was believe uh, between 15,000 and 60,000 square foot for the footprint. Ours is going to be smaller than that because our site is much smaller. Um, and so it's going to be that complementary type of node, not a strip development. The orientation of this parcel along 54 truly lends itself to just adding on to that node and not having a, a long commercial strip as well. Um, and I'd also like to point out several of the text commitments that, that speak to that, um, that node creation. We have, as I mentioned, the limit on self-storage is necessarily a low impact uh, type of uh, commercial use that speaks to that type of um, service-oriented commercial use. We also have a text commitment limiting the type of materials and committing to architectural features such as parapet walls and storefront windows that, again, lend itself to that complementary node and not your type of uh, auto-oriented strip center. And so for those reasons, we believe the changes, in addition to the new proffer of the cross-access easement, brings us more in line with, with the concerns that the uh, commission expressed before. It brings the properties more in line with each other and brings, them, brings us more in line with the elements of the comprehensive plan that the staff outlined tonight. And for those reasons, we'd ask uh, for a favorable recommendation forward to the uh, council. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sivers? Good evening, Tim Sivers, Horvath Associates, 16 Consultant Place. I just want to bring up a few points on the development plan, um, specifically some items that have changed and have not changed. Um, Self-storage is one of, if not the lowest, re lowest uh, retail traffic generator. The additional trips for this site are uh, 31 peak hour trips, uh, <coughs> but I did want to note that this is not a change from what was previously approved. Uh, the project boundary buffers to the north, east, and west are shown in the development plan. There were also no changes to those items from what was previously approved. The minimum of 35 foot of right-of-way dedication is also the same. The site will have a single access point on the NC-54, again the same. Uh, the only changes on the development plan are the cross-access easement as well as the text commitment changes to the traffic improvements as, no as was noted by Jamie. Um, again, we just asked for your approval of this project and we're available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Llewellyn. Okay, great. He's just here for questions. So at this point, we will close the public hearing. Uh, before we come to the commissioners, I think I would like to just check in with staff on the, the proffers, make sure everything is uh, acceptable. And Jamie Sonyak with the planning department. We had the opportunity to review the language regarding the cross access easement and it um, is found acceptable. So if it is found um, to be recommended that would be added to the development plan. Great, thank you. Uh, commissioners who would like to speak? Start to my right. Commissioner Ghosh. Commissioner Ghosh. So uh, I, I voted in favor of this last time with the caveat that I'd like to see some cross access. Thank you for providing it. I'll vote in favor of it again. Thank you. Commissioner Miller. So it's my understanding that the developer of the other project told the council that they would offer cross access. They weren't required to include it as a requirement of their development plan. And since having obtained their approval, they've made they've not reached out to you. That's what is that what you said? Yes, it, it actually was a requirement of their development plan, I believe, and I'm not sure it was timed to any uh, particular timing, assuming it would be at some point before their, their building permit, obviously. 
um, Jamie Sanyak, it was tied to the site plan. Site plan, but not the development plan. So it was they can a, withdraw it anytime they want to. I believe it was a it was an offer at the table that I that I was understanding was to become a text commitment on the development plan. It's correct. It's a commitment on the development plan, but the requirement to have it in in place would be prior to the site plan. So it is in their development plan. That's right. But okay, let's make sure. I'm talking about the commercial. Mm -hmm. Okay, I misunderstood you. I thought you said that that the council didn't require them because to do it since they that they just made a promise. No, I, what I meant was it might not have shown up on the development plan going to council, but it was at the table during the council decision. So it was a proffer made and then written in later? Yes. As a condition, okay, that helps. I do understand. Uh, and, and I didn't mean to misrepresent that they're refusing to do it. It's just no, 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 they no, haven't no. reached I, it yet. I, because I misunderstood what you said, I, I, I ran with it the wrong direction. Uh, so thank you. That's... I'm still concerned about this. This is an unusual request. It's uh, 120,000 square feet of storage on a piece of property that is less than two acres uh, with a building envelope that is uh, essentially 75,000 square feet. The per acre, I mean, that's a, that is 63,000 square feet of building uh, per acre. Uh, that's pretty intense. This property doesn't even include its own bu boundary buffers. They are on, the boundary buffers are on neighboring properties. Um, I'm not saying that that's against the rules. It's just something I don't like. Uh, it means that, the, that if we rezone this, the property owner next door has to hold, their, it, it has to buffer whatever they choose to use their property for uh, against this use rather than including the buffers on this site. Um, I realize the code allows it, but it's, it, to me, it's, it's just wrong. Uh, it's also, to, in order to get 120,000 square feet of storage building on this site, it's going to have to go four stories, five stories, four stories. Um, thank you. Uh, that's pretty tall. This property sits up on a hill. If you went up into the neighboring apartment complex, the property rises uh, above it. Those, this building is going to tower over even the two-story apartment building next door. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that when we, you know, I fought against this commercial node that's there. Uh, and it seems to me that when we expand a commercial node, it ought to step down in intensity to residential, not up in intensity to residential, literally up. Um, and so I'm still going to vote against it. Uh, however, I do appreciate the fact that there's uh, interconnectivity, which in my opinion uh, is a minimum requirement in order to even call this the, these two uses together a node. Any other commissioners with questions or comments? Um, yeah. I'm just, Commissioner Ghosh? Just responding to something I heard. I think Commissioner Miller's comments are, are well received. I think one of the things that I find attractive about this development plan is that it limits the use to self-storage. Yes, it's a lot of self-storage, but in speaking about stepping up or down in intensity with expansions of commercial nodes towards residential areas, at least the use is not very intense. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Commissioner Ghosh. Seeing no other questions or comments, this is the appropriate time for a motion. Uh, oh, uh, one moment. Uh, I apologize. Just before you do that, uh, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department, can the applicant just confirm on the record that um, that text commitment number six is going to be removed, that you're making that request? <clears throat> Yes, we are making that request. Thanks. I have one other question. Back to my point about interconnectivity. Is Do you show interconnectivity on your development plan? We haven't shown it, but if, offer, if, if accepted here tonight, we will. They just made the offer tonight. That's okay. Right. And so you're, that's going forward. All right. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So just to confirm, then, we, we, are, we have, uh, we have interconnectivity. We have interconnectivity as a proffer that will then 
move forward and will show up as this moves forward. Commissioner Hyman? Yes, um, Chair Busby, I'd like to uh, make a motion that we move case number Z1700001 NC54 storage forward with a favorable recommendation. Second. Properly moved and seconded. Moved by Commissioner Hyman, seconded by Commissioner Harris. All those in favor, uh, please raise your right hand. And all those opposed, same sign. Motion carries eight to four. Thank you very much. Thank you. Extra vote. We are now moving to the home stretch. Text amendments to the Unified Development Ordinance. And we have a case TC17 quadruple zero five. Good evening, I'm Scott Whiteman for the Planning Department, filling in for the world famous Michael Stock. Uh, tonight before you is case number TC170005, which is the 11th in a series of omnibus changes to the UDO that many of you are, have seen before. Uh, these changes are designed to be technical revisions and minor policy changes uh, to the UDO that can be adopted all at one time. Uh, one thing that is different with this set is we are now trying to do them twice a year so that the list of changes is uh, slightly more manageable than what you may have seen before. I will, the, these changes touch uh, many of the articles throughout the UDO. I'll be happy to answer any questions about any of the changes, but I just want to mention a few of the, the, the bigger things and highlights. First, we are adding some additional standards for minor preliminary plats. We are adding parking standards to the list of things that may be uh, modified with the neighborhood protection overlay, which is something that came out of the development of the Old West Durham NPO. It's a removal of parking requirements for accessory dwellings. The clarifying text regarding outdoor activities for certain home occupations. A technical amendment regarding development in the rural tiers or areas not within a designated tier an additional height allowance for the IL district within the suburban, suburban tier, adjustments to on-street parking allowances uh, for parking requirements for single-family and two-family developments, uh, revisions to the support to 30-foot, 30 35-foot height limitations in our design districts, uh, additional text allowing for lot width flexibility associated with affordable housing developments, uh, removal of the dimensional requirement, uh, two acre minimum for the PDR district in the urban tier. <coughs> uh, revision to household living parking standards for qualified affordable housing. And uh, clarifying the defined term for a flag lot. The, this text amendment as per the procedure has been presented to the Joint City County Planning Committee. Uh, the staff would recommend approval and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll open, I'm sorry, wait, we'll, we'll actually open the public hearing. We have no one who has signed up to speak. If anyone would like to speak, this is your chance. Seeing none, we will move to close the public hearing, and then we will move to comments from the commissioners. We'll start with Commissioner Ghosh. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to go in order the, of the handout. I've made notations, and I have questions and or comments throughout, so hopefully... I won't take too much of your time. Um, <clears throat> okay, on uh, page five, convenience stores with gas sales. Um, I have a question about the limitation <laughs> of this new uh, provision, which says that no more than 50% of required parking spaces shall be provided at fueling stations. I just, I guess I don't understand what the issue is that we're addressing there. Uh, to me, I, I mean, I've worked with different gas stations. To me, you know, this wouldn't affect something like Sheets, who generally tries to get as many parking spaces at their C store as they can, but it might affect the mom and pop stores that have four pumps and not a lot of room for parking. And if it if it did affect those uh, those types of stores, I mean, I think it does so in a in a kind of negative way. It would it would just require them to add more parking spaces, which might mean 
more impervious for, and I guess I don't understand the reason why. I think what we're finding is with certain gas stations, especially ones with a lot of pumps, the they can fulfill all their parking requirements at the pumps, which leads to uh, parking issues and stacking issues. And if Bill judges here could probably give a more detailed, thorough answer about the, the problem. Yeah, uh, Bill Judge, transportation. That's that's correct. What we found is that where there's a large number of pumps and a fairly small convenience store. Um, that basically the parking requirements could be met just by people parking at the pump. So we wanted to clarify or provide that some of the, that there would still be some parking provided. Okay. I mean, I, that's, that's fine. I mean, I, I was just looking for clarification. I don't really understand it because I can't say I've ever experienced, I've never circled the parking lot of a gas station looking for a C store spot. Sometimes you have to queue at the, at the pump. It, 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 you know, all the pumps were taken, but I've never experienced myself. Haven't seen it, but if it happens, it happens. Um, another question I had is uh, on page six, uh, eliminating the requirement for one additional off-street parking space um, for accessory <coughs> dwelling units. I understand that that might um, make it more of a possibility to be able to provide those accessory dwelling units, but um, you know, on page two, one of the one of the justifications or, or statement, I don't know what it, what you would call this, uh, for that change was that um, it's been an, uh, determined to be unnecessary for additional off street parking since single family lots generally have enough driveway or parking pad space to accommodate more than two vehicles. I mean, I think we could just accommodate that by saying you have to provide one off-street parking spot, and it can be on your driveway or your existing driveway or parking pad. That would kind of satisfy both. If the, the current parking standards for single family do allow driveway, but you can only have, you can only stack two cars. Mm. I guess what I'm saying is I think there's another way to word this so, such that, you know, it can address the exact reason that you're looking at this. So you wouldn't have to provide an additional off-street parking space if you do, in fact, have enough space on your lot already. We can certainly look at that and see if it accomplishes the same thing. Um, and sorry, again. Uh, page 8B1, um, yeah. I think the wording is a little off. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure. I don't have a... I don't have a Suggestion, but a residential building shall also include a building converted to a non-residential use. I mean, it, it, it doesn't, I don't know, it just, that, that could be anything, right? I mean, it should be a previously residential building that has since been converted, you know, something like that. It doesn't, doesn't quite jive, I guess. And then on 682, same page, 682B, um, the base zoning requirement for lot width can apply for lots developed for affordable housing dwelling units. There's another section that allows uh, those standards to be changed for affordable housing dwelling units. So I think, you know, maybe a, a note, I think it's 662 allows you to change some of the uh, uh, lot standards. So I think that needs to be recognized in this provision. So you know, or as reduced by, you know, pursuant to Section 660. Yeah, the issue we're trying to rectify is that <clears throat> UDO specifies that the most stringent should apply. So if one is reduced, but then one is increased yeah. through the infill standards, then you would have to follow the increased lots, lot size through the infill standards or lot width. Um, so we're trying to rectify that, that for affordable housing projects only, you can, you do not need to follow the affordable housing Okay, so maybe it is a, maybe I misread it, but yeah, that's what I'm saying. For affordable housing units, you should be able to to reduce it. Um, I I will admit that I didn't check what the current UDO says, but on uh, six ten one a one a that's being what added. What page are you on, please? Uh, page eight. Thanks. All right. It says it, the new added language says the standards for I zoning shall apply to I L zoning. I mean that just seems. I don't know, it, that's not true, unless you're making it true. You know, it, it, IL zoning is its own thing. It's not I zoning. So. so there's a weird quirk that we found in the ordinance where um, 
IL zoning was not through the UDO permitted in the rural tier, um, the, but the I zoning district was, so there were no standards to the IL district included for properties in the rural tier. You're just trying to match them. And so the same there thing. are a few legacy IL properties, and so we want to make sure that there is a zoning standard that applies to them. Yeah, fair uh, enough. So, so this was the, the quickest and even most reasonable way to do that. I guess what I was saying is it certainly seemed like the quickest way. <laughs> I think there might be a better way to do it. Um, on page 9, 61113B1, uh, instead of changing it to no minimum acreage shall be required, I think it would be appropriate just to delete bullet point one for the urban tier because, I mean, that's essentially what you're saying, right? No. We have some issues with that because there are other tiers as well, so it would apply that, and the, but the PDR is not supposed to apply. So we'll, we'll definitely take that under consideration, but I think it's clear to show that that's the standard for the urban tier is no minimum. Okay. Um, and then uh, on the table on the next page, underneath there's a note there that says, the rear yard shall be measured, blah, 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 blah. I was just wondering if someone could demonstrate what that is. I don't, I don't recognize what the issue is there. I don't know if there's a way to, to demonstrate what that's addressing. I don't have any other problem with it. Hmm? Interpretive dance. Yeah, sure, that'd be great. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, I would have a hard time uh, demonstrating it without um, one Drawing. of those telestrator pens like they, they use at football games. Got a dry erase board. <laughs> I don't think, I think it's a bulletin board, Mr. Commissioner Miller, and the city clerk would be very mad if I drew on that. Okay. Well, that solves that mystery. I was wondering what this is. I wouldn't tangle with it. Yeah. Uh, my boss is telling me that we can add an illustration to this as it moves forward to make it clear. They, oh, that might be helpful. Yeah, yeah, the general idea is that townhouse developments don't have a rear yard that is associated like, with each lot. Like a single family house does. So yeah. we need to clarify where it's measured from. So, but that's a good point. If, if you're having trouble visualizing it, lots of people have trouble visualizing it. Well, yeah, okay. So an, that wasn't my suggestion, but I'll make it my suggestion now. I think an illustration would make it look You're better. allowed to do that. <laughs> Uh, and that's all I got. Oh, no, I'm sorry. One more. On page 15, um, when we're defining flag lots, um, I th okay, I don't know that there's a better word for it or whatever, but uh, in the first part it says, uh, and is located behind another lot. I, I feel like the word behind is not, I don't know, it could describe a lot of things, and I think that might be an issue with the UDL. Um, I, I mean, generally, I know what a flag lot is, but I don't know that this is a better definition than what we had. And then the the uh, the other thing is, uh, number two, it seems to suggest that a flag lot could only have one street frontage, and that's what I'm familiar with. I just don't know if that's true, though. I feel like a flag lot could have multiple frontages and still be a flag lot, but I don't know. <laughs> Flag with more than one pole. Yeah. Could, yeah. Uh, I don't. We'll double check to make sure that we're not accidentally prohibiting flag lots with two poles. But I think this, <laughs> this doesn't prohibit that. It just yeah. It just defines it. I just want to. Yeah. Your flag only has to have one pole. Okay. All right. That's all I got. Thank you. Sorry for taking everyone's time. That's very helpful, Commissioner Bryan. Thank you. On page seven, uh, the. Section 6.6 .6 on the affordable housing bonus. Uh, yeah, let's try to. I would uh, just as soon not have to vote on that language tonight because this is where you conflict with the mm -hmm. affordable housing text that we looked at earlier, and I think it needs to be worked out as to what language you're going to use in the affordable housing text. I mean, if you read PC 16005 carefully, <coughs> these two sections don't exist anymore. If I may, Mr. Chairman? Uh, you may, and then we'll welcome a staff response if appropriate. So if the there are two affordable housing density bonuses, there's the one that the other text amendment that we considered earlier 
That relates to the affordable housing density bonus inside the compact, compact neighborhood tiers. There is also an affordable housing density bonus that is available outside those tiers anywhere where residential zoning is allowed. That, that certainly may be true, but the point is in, in the earlier text that we think the 66.1 applicability and 66.2 bonus program those were stricken. Oh, those are stricken. That is a problem. And so, and this is why, you know, the conflict comes in. And I, I'm suggesting since I, Hannah's response to my question it, about it was that they're working on it. I think we should simply not vote on this particular piece. Well, I would be willing to vote on it if I knew what the workout was. Well, and, and they, they haven't, apparently haven't solved it yet. Okay. Uh, what we're going to do, we'll take anything that is covered in the, pre the previous affordable housing text amendment uh, <clears throat> take it out. case, take it out of this one and put it in that, make sure that all those are rectified so that it's adopted at the same time, should one be adopted, one not, or be adopted at mm -hmm. separate times. Okay, that, that's good because of the very first thing here on, on A, if you take out that language, you're going to have to take it out some other places in the earlier text amendment that we considered. You know, little things like that. That's a fair point. Uh, I have one more thing. <coughs> Bottom of page 13. Uh, methods to exceed maximum parking. It says the additional parking spaces and drive aisles shall be pervious paving pursuant to the following. But what's following is alternative to the methods of compliance. So I think something's left out. Mm -hmm. Think. Commissioner Bryan, if, if those are the... Those are, those are my only comments. Great. If those are your remarks, we'll move to Commissioner Miller while the, the staff... <laughs> oh, the staff is back. Mr. The Whiteman. Is back. Yeah, we. I think what that is, it was referring to a definition, and it was also listed in the, the list of things. We probably should have left the, that list of things in here for context, and we'll do that before we provide it to the, to the governing bodies. We are not changing what qualifies as previous. Mm. Thank you. Commissioner Miller? Yeah. <laughs> So I had a couple of questions, uh, which remarkably did not overlap much with Mr. Ghosh. <laughs> Amazing. However, I'm very grateful for the points you raised. They were good ones. Um, I thought I was pretty thorough. I thought you were pretty thorough too, but you- Evidently not. So again, this, this relates to, to help me understand, and I'm on page eight, what 6.8.1 has changed will do. Give me an example. So what this does is it takes things like a daycare that was a former house mm -hmm. that's within a residential district. The CPA's way office or? <laughs> yeah, it would typically be something that would because this only applies to residential zoning. Okay, it wouldn't be a that, CPA's office. Yeah, uh, that because it's strictly worded as residential uses, then that house, which probably is in the historical context of the rest of the houses, doesn't count. Uh, so we're just making sure that anything that looks like a house on the street is counted towards the infill standards. Oh, for the purposes of? Of setbacks, mostly. All right, very good. Um, I, and so, um, So my, I have a similar question with 6.8.3a. I am, you know, the, the language that, uh, that we've used in these two things, that structures which change their use, it is possible, I suppose, to actually have, as we have in my neighborhood, commercial structures that were built as commercial structures that are now in residential zones. How shall we treat those? And they're not even, some of them are not commercial. They're houses now. And some of them are just strange things, and they're so far away that nobody knows they're there. Uh, admittedly, this doesn't really address those. Uh, it's not 
nearly as common. I know there are some of those throughout, especially the older neighborhoods. Lots of lots of little neighborhood stores, uh, and we've got a Quonset hut in my neighborhood that is filled with pest, old, very, very, very old pesticides. Um, yeah, I'll have to say that I've been, Mike and I and Sarah and lots of the staff have been trying to tweak the infill standards to make them work well for years. It's hard to hit every scenario. Um, I was just wondering, yeah. is there, is, so it's possible that we're there st there's still work to do? Yeah, there's, there's definitely still work to do. All right. We're, we're just uh, chipping away. All right, and then so if you would go to 1633 C1, A2, B, and A3. What page is that? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. Um, it's got to be at the back. 15? 1633. So it has to do with the 75 feet. It, I like the language in the UC zone that we call it the perimeter transitional area, although we don't use that language here. Um, I get very confused about, I thought it was a great idea when you brought it to us, but now it's, it's got so many moving parts, I'm having a hard time visualizing how it would work. Am I reading this right, that the maximum height inside that 75-foot area for downtown is 50 feet, and for 9th Street, it's 45 feet or 35 feet? I don't understand why. The, it seems to me if the impetus is the same, then the height limit ought to be the same. The idea is to not destabilize the outside the district traditional residential use. And I don't understand why at 9th Street, we, the, the, the protecting height is 35 feet, and, the, and for the downtown tier, the protecting height is a different thing. I'm very confused about how it works. Can you run through it? So there are two different standards that were adopted at two different times based on two, the input of two separate, mostly separate sets of stakeholders. Um, this was not trying to change those very much. So what are the, what are the, how does it work? Start with downtown. So downtown is 50 feet if it's within 75 feet of a non-design zoning district. <laughs> the limit is 35 feet. It's 35 feet within the 50 feet. <coughs> within 75 feet. I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Sarah Young with the planning department. So in both cases in downtown and in the compact design district, the default is 35 feet in that 75 foot depth. That's okay, the that's our point. beginning standard. Right. So that's the, that's the default. And if we want to do something different inside the 75 feet, what can we do and how do we get there? So in downtown, through a minor special use permit, you can go up to 50 feet. Okay. okay so that's option for, for that one. In, I'm sorry, I'm skimming. In CD, so compact design, the only one we have in place is at 9th Street. You can do the same thing, but it only gets you 45 feet. And I think is, it's an MUP still, hmm? still with an MUP process. Yes, correct. And I think the difference stems, and I would, don't quote me on this because I'd have to go back and look. Um, we based the numbers based on what was originally in the two districts for height, and they did have different, they did not have the same heights in the various areas. So that accounts for why one is slightly less. If there's no significant, you know, feeling of difference in that five feet, we can make them consistent if... I'm not asking for that. I just wanted to make sure I understood uh -oh. what I was reading. Um, yeah, so this the is for information. Is and now with the affordable housing density bonus, which is going to be available in the uh, compact neighborhood design tier and probably immaterial in the downtown tier, um, the there is... At site plan, inside the 75 feet, I can go, I asked this once and I'm already, I've already forgotten. I can go up to how high in the 75 feet? Do you go up to 50? 50 feet. But only with the affordable housing density bonus. Right, and I don't have to get the MUP. I jump over that step. That's correct. Okay. 
All right, I'm cool with that. Let's let's vote. <laughs> Commissioner Miller is cool with that. So at this point, I will entertain a motion for approval. So I'm going to move that we send this omnibus uh, text change TC17 quadruple zero five forward to the city and to the county uh, with a favorable recommendation, but with some of the changes that my fellow commission members have suggested, especially the one, the apparent inconsistencies or potential for inconsistencies as uh, in the proposals contained in uh, this omnibus 11 and the uh, compact neighborhood interim affordable housing bonus proposal. Um, I would love to see all of those kind of worked out um, going forward. And I, but I also throw in, I, I do see why uh, in a system that creates a lot of, of minimum acreages, why you would want to have say zero when you meant zero so that somebody didn't think that some, it was just a, a hole in the, in the ordinance. I Something's second the motion without the comments. <laughs> All right, be that way. <laughs> Properly moved by Commissioner Miller, seconded by Commissioner Harris. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Motion carries 13 to zero. Thank you very much. And last but not least, the compact neighborhood I'm sorry. Uh, Legal and. Yes. Leg and S and E. Case TC17 quadruple zero six. Mr. Whiteman. Good evening. I'm Scott Whiteman from the Planning Department. Again, uh, this is, uh, without the shorthand, uh, technical update regarding sedimentation and erosion control and state legislation. Uh, half of this amendment is something you're also probably uh, accustomed to seeing, which is changes we must make to our ordinance. Uh, based on laws that are passed by the state legislature. Uh, it also includes um, a set of changes requested by our county s &E office, and we have Ryan Eves from County Engineering to, to answer any questions about those. Um, in general, there's uh, two laws that were, were passed this year that we felt required uh, amendments to the UDO. One was uh, statute of limitations uh, that was imposed for zoning violations. And the other was um, how the city council adopts consistency statements. Unfortunately, the legislature adopted the way method the counties did it, which was backwards. So now they're both backwards. Um, there's also some for several collective state laws about uh, performance guarantees for infrastructure projects. And as uh, I mentioned, some changes, request technical changes uh, for sedimentation erosion control. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and uh, the staff would recommend approval. Thank you very much. We will open the public comment period. We don't have anyone signed up. If anyone would like to speak, this is your time. Seeing none, we will close the public comment period and move to commissioners with any comments. I'll start to my right. Commissioner Ghosh. Um. I must admit I'm not uh, as thoroughly prepared for this one as maybe the previous, but I think I had a question about, um, uh, part, okay, it's on page nine, part two. And I thought the change in North Carolina law, there was another kind of exempt subdivision that was created. And I, I'm not sure that it's codified here. The only one we're aware of is the one that specifically talked about probated wills and the division of land for that. Every, all the other exempt subdivision standards remain. Okay. So you, uh, the official position is this is what's consistent with what uh, recent changes in North Carolina law. Yes. All right. We're not trying to hide from any of them. That's, that's, that works for me. That's cool. Commissioner Harris? My... On page three, 3.8.6, self-inspection, that's like putting the fox in the hen house. And that's what the state law does. And that's what the state law did. I mean, I don't have to be happy with it, but I know that's what the state required us to do, so. But 
I, I, that's like, you know, putting a fox in the hen house and tell him not to eat the chicken. <laughs> I would agree with Commissioner Harris, and I did not use as colorful as an analogy as he did at the <laughs> Joint City County Planning Committee meeting when this came up, but I'm, I'm planning to vote to approve to ensure we conform with state law. Mm -hmm. I don't like the state law. Any other commissioners? Would, Commissioner Gibbs? <clears throat> I guess my question is general in nature. Uh, by adopting these, uh, these new rules, I'll say, uh, would it conflict or be less, less strict in some of our planned let's say, erosion control plans. Uh, <clears throat> is the state less strict than what we would need here in Durham to, because of our special uh, situations? I'll defer to Mr. Eves to, to answer that, or try his best to answer that question. Um, I do, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, good evening, Ryan Eves. I'm the uh, Stormwater and Erosion Control Division Manager for uh, County Engineering. Um, if I understand your question, you're asking if, if by making these changes it makes us less strict than the state, or is the state going to be less strict? I'm, I'm not sure I quite understand your question. Would adoption of, would the state restrictions <laughs> be less strict than some some issue that we're trying to deal with locally. Would it prohibit, inhibit, or any other way hold us back from doing what we feel we need to do to control a situation in Durham County? I don't believe so. Um, I mean, my division handles all erosion control, both inside the city limits and out. Um, we do m at least monthly inspections of all of the permitted sites within the county. Um, and I don't believe any of the, uh, while there are some things we don't necessarily agree with or like, I don't believe that they will hinder us from acting appropriately to making sure that our sites uh, maintain compliance. Okay, well, that, that answers my general question. Uh, I don't like the state rules either, but <clears throat> that's neither here nor there. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll let it go for now. I'm ready. Hey, thank you, and thank you for staying so late to, Happy to. to share your input. Any other comments or questions from commissioners? And if not, I'll... Mr. Chairman, I move TC, that we send uh, text uh, change TC1700006 forward to the city and county with a favorable recommendation. Second. Properly moved and seconded. Moved by Commissioner Miller, seconded by Commissioner Alturk. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Any Final staff updates before we adjourn for the year. No updates. Thank you. Thank you. And before we do adjourn, I did want to, number one, thank the staff for your great work this year. We really appreciate all that you do. And uh, I know they're late nights, but we appreciate that you stick with us, answer our questions, let us have the robust debate that I think we deserve to have on behalf of the citizens. And I wish you all happy holidays. I, I do also want to note that Commissioner Freeman, uh, as you know, has resigned from her seat to now become Councilwoman Freeman. That position is currently open, and it is open until January 8th. So if you know of any good candidates, I would ask you to encourage them to apply. Or if you're still watching at home, you probably do want to apply if you've sat here this entire evening. Uh, with that, I wish you all happy holidays. This yeah, meeting is adjourned. Don't want to apply. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, I'm not going to start with DJ.